Okay, people. So, yes, yes, yes. Now, if you do not recognize the dude in the other window, what the fuck are you doing, people? Right? <laughs> because the big homie is back. You know what I mean? The man, the filmmaker, the writer, the model inspiration. You know what I mean? And now the new podcast host. I'm talking about Double O Flemings, Marcus Flemings, man. Welcome to the pod. <laughs> That is the best intro I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> That's brilliant. Although you did say, I don't want anyone to be confused. I'm not a model. You just say model. And hey, but you in nurture it. models, man. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I do. Um, yeah, yeah. So I do that. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. do look at me and go, oh, so what, it's a model, model inspiration. You're nurturing you the models, you man. Go. Like that. I like you, that. You've you got your model it. greenhouse and you're growing. <laughs> <It's> growing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. Sunlight, right? Sunlight. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, how have you been, sir? Man, just trying to do stuff. You know what I mean? Just um, mm. watching a lot of films, mm. you know, trying to um, build this thing up. Yep. Trying to get the other podcast back in rotation, mm -hmm. but time is a pain in the ass, right? Um, yeah, yeah, time, you know, man. time is a pain in the ass, but oh my god, I just never have enough of it. I, I love the fact that you watch so many films because that's all I do, and, <laughs> <laughs> and they don't understand. They don't understand it when I say I'm going to be watching it. Like I schedule it. I go, okay, Friday, I'm going to watch a film. Saturday, I'm going to watch a film. Sunday, I'm going to watch a film. People are like, oh, why don't you just go out and have fun and meet your friends? And I'm like, B -b because I prefer to watch a film. <laughs> give me more comfort. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you can identify with the pain, the struggle. Sometimes it's a struggle because some films, especially nowadays, are challenging. They're very challenging. Yes. Well, yeah, you've got the challenging film, which is bad, but you've been asked to watch it, which is just, oh, I've just done that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because the thing is, I feel when I'm talking about a film, I don't necessarily just want to rip it apart. Because mm -hmm. I understand that just because I don't like something doesn't mean it's trash, right? There's other people are going to like it. You know what I mean? We don't all have the same taste. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that has to be considered and isn't always. Yes. But exactly. then, you, and also like people, you know, the actors, the, the, you know, the cinematographer, editor, there's so much work that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though this film might be an hour and a half. Right, it, it takes months, if not years, sometimes to put this stuff together. So you don't mm -hmm. want to completely rip it apart. But then also, you want to give honest feedback, right? Because they think there's a way of talking about things without being completely disrespectful. But I think it could help people going forward, right? Because if you talk about like, man, like they didn't quite get the chemistry in this situation. They might look at it and go, actually, yeah, mm. he's right. We should mm. work on that next time. Or yeah. yes, let's do that next time. And we can bring this in and blah, blah, blah. So you just want to be, you want to talk about, but you want to try and be positive. You know mm. what I mean? So that's that can be tough. That can be yeah. tough. Yeah, obviously, because uh, I've made a, a few films now, and I've had good reviews, I've had bad reviews, I've had scathing reviews. And you're, you're so right. There's been stuff that people have said that I've looked at and gone, okay, that's true. In the next film, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix that. I'm going to do this instead. Um, but I think sometimes when you're a creative, you're your own worst critic. Mm. So the stuff that I watch and I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't want to do that ever again. And... I think you're right. You need to be honest. Though. As a critic, I think you need to give your honest opinion. And it may not be the same opinion as someone else, but yes. it's your opinion, right? And your opinion counts in the story. Because the same way that, <clears throat> like, if a film is a film good or not, it's subjective. A critic's opinion on a film is also subjective as well. So mm. if you're not being honest, then you're not a good critic. So I think you're, you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, try it. Like, what do you think about that, though? Right? Because I sometimes I'll see, you know, people talk about stuff and be like, oh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it says this, or Meteorology, mm. it says this. Mm. And yeah. I'm just like, yo, but it's a, like, 
I don't really care what they say because I feel it's a good film. Because I, yeah. it was like John Carter, for instance, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I like that film. Mm-hmm. I thought John Carter was a, a fun film. It wasn't the best film in the world, but it was mm-hmm. fun. I thought the problem with John Carter was the marketing because oh, sure. no one knew what the fuck it was about. Yes. <laughs> right? And yeah. I'm just like, if no one knows what this is about, people ain't necessarily going to... Because it's so expensive now to mm-hmm. go to the cinema. Yeah. Right? Back in the day, five pounds. Five pounds. Not anymore. Get a ticket, right? That's the bus fare. And... <laughs> Across the road, get some penny sweets and a panda pop. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's so true! It's so true. It's 20 pounds now, 20 pounds for one person. Yeah, five pounds ain't even gonna buy you anything on the concession. That's true. That's so true. Oh my god, that's so like a bottle of water is probably five pounds now. Oh, it's insane. I, I, I so John Carter is a good example of. I think that film was bombed by the critics, and I think the film bombed because of the critics. Yeah, and you're right; they didn't market it very well. And I thankfully I knew the lead actor. I didn't know him personally, but I knew of the lead actor. I was kind of seeing him rise, and I was like, I want him to do well, so I'm going to go and watch this film. Mm. And, um, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, mm. I actually enjoyed it. I mean, if you compare it to some of the films that have come out in the past year. Um, that I've watched, I think I think one film that I'm not going to spare any wrath for is Love and Thunder, which honestly was I I I felt was it's drained my soul. Um, <laughs> it just took my soul from me. So it's better than that film. And quite frankly, I love the character of Doctor Strange, but that last film, I don't know what was wrong with it. Like it felt good the first half an hour. I was like, this is this is good. I'm liking this. Is I'm really enjoying this. Especially after Spider Man, is it No Way Home? Um, I was like, this is, I'm enjoying this film. And then suddenly it just went downhill. And I, I don't know, I don't know what it, what it was, because I love Sam Raimi, but something happened during that film where I left the cinema. I was like, do not want to go back to cinema ever again. Uh... And, and I haven't, I've not been back to cinema since last year, February. Oh, shit. Well, it's strange. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but this, I'm not doing this anymore. You don't need to fix up. <laughs> you need to fix up. I'm not paying. You said it yourself. Like it's not five pounds anymore. You're paying twenty pounds a pop. So mm. you better start making some good films, or I'm not going. Simple. Yeah. I. I mean, I didn't mind Doctor Strange. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't feel it was necessary as sh- it, like it's not the strongest in the MCU. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Right. And I do feel that. At times, it's pushing out a lot of content, mm. you know, with the MCU staff. But mm. so I do like what they've been saying lately that they're they're not necessarily gonna do trilogies on everything, okay. and That's... that they're gonna kind of, you know, it, they, they're gonna think about the story and, you know, like let's just make one film for this person or two films and then we can tell their story somewhere else Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I like, yeah, I think spreading things out a bit more, I think that will work. But I think one of the things I did kind of enjoy about The Last Doctor Strange Mm -hmm. was the horror approach. Yes. And just the fact that they went a little bit different on the visuals and the story that I thought, you know what I mean? Because yeah, the writing wasn't necessarily great all the way through, but I like sometimes when people take, you know, big swings, you know, even if yeah. it doesn't always hit, I appreciate the attempt. It felt like to me, and I love the fact that you brought that up because I think that was my problem with it is that it felt like to me that the producers of Marvel or Disney now we're making a different film to what Sam Raimi wanted to make. Um, Cause obviously he's traditionally a horror director. Yeah. When he, when he was allowed to have a bit of flair, I was like, I was enjoying it. Like there's a scene where Dr. Strange is fighting. Dr. Strange has got the musical. Oh theme. yeah. That, like, this that is was cool. Good. Yeah. This is cool. Yeah, yeah. But then, then they try and push the other stuff in there, the typical Marvel uh, MCU stuff in there. And it, it didn't mesh well for me personally. I would have preferred if it's let Sam Raimi just do what he wants and have fun with it. That'd be a much better film for me, anyway. Mm, mm. 
And they did do a horror short kind of thing. I didn't Disney see that. I know talked about it. Yeah. I know yeah. Werewolf that. by Night. And mm. I enjoyed that. That yeah, was really good. That. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, one, that, one, that one was good. I've had so, my the thing is, I had my fingers burnt so many times that because <laughs> I, I watched everything. I watched one division which I didn't enjoy, and then I watched what uh, New Captain America, and watched them all up until uh, Moon Knight. Um, and I was like, I'm done. Like you're right. Like I'm glad they're changing it and stopping and like just just slow down, slow down. Mm. Just to watch. You know, and the CGI is looking bad, and the storylines are looking bad, and is they just need to slow down and go, what are we what are we doing? What's happening? Let's, let's mm, mm. reassess. Because if unless they do that, these the new DC DCEU, the new the new uh yeah. DC films are gonna take over for sure. They're gonna take over for sure. Yeah, they could do. Which I mean, I want them to do better. It'd be good for the mm. DC films to do better. Mm. Because I think mm. that strengthens everything. Yes, agreed. You know. Agreed. So true, like competition mm. you know, improves, improves you, doesn't it? Like, yes. if, you, if you look at uh, some of the great rivalries of all time, like I don't know if you like football, like Ronaldo and Messi, like, mm. to higher levels. And I think right now, Marvel have got slack because the DCEU is so far behind, yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. Behind. oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't love the last Batman. Oh, I didn't like that either. Oh man, oh cool. There's everyone's talking about it like it's d incredible, but I no. watch it and I'm just like, I'm not buying this. I'm not like, buying. That's a classic example of a studio and critics saying, This is good, it's mm. good, it's good. And then you go, Is it? Yeah, is it, good? It, it felt because it was long, and I don't mind a long film. But the great thing about a great long film is you don't notice it's a long yes. film. And yes. I noticed Batman was a long film. <laughs> 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 it's so long. It's three hours. And it's, yeah. and it's not exactly the most engaging character to, to have on screen for three hours, just walking around dark rooms in a dark suit mm. for three hours. And unfortunately... <laughs> I love 90s films, and I'm sure you do too. So I've seen seven, seven times. I've seen seven, yeah. seven times. And it's just a ripoff of seven. It's just, it follows the same beats. It's same, mm -hmm. same mood lighting, same same ending. Like, seven is so much better. Oh it's much God. better as well. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot better. There's, it's, who was the bad guy? It was the scarecrow? Is it the scare? Riddler? In the in this one. Oh yeah, the Riddler. Yes, Riddler. it was the Riddler, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It was when you look at when they did the whole the reveal, it was like, oh, this is the Riddler. And you're just like, and you saw the things the Riddler had done earlier in the film. You're just like, a, that dude can't really <laughs> do those things. He's too small to pick that person up or do that. Like, what are we saying? You like, oh, know, one. With one swing of a thing, he caved that dude. Not that dude ain't doing that. Like, what are we saying? Huh? What's happening here? Come on. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> and he's so unhinged as well. And these mm. intricate plans. And it, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I remember the Riddler from the 60s. Um, not that I was around then, but I remember the, watching as a kid, watching those old Batman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and the Riddler was always like a joker and like just Riddly and like kind of tiptoe. This guy was just incel, just straight up dark, mm -hmm. destructive incel. And that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about the DC law to say that's not how the Riddler is, but I'm assuming that's not how the Riddler is because I've not seen him portrayed like that before. But yes. Could... Yeah. Like you could tell that they wanted to make it darker. Mm -hmm. So they thought, oh, let, let's, you know, make him this. Yes. And I'm just yes. like, it doesn't necessarily work. No, you know, doesn't work at all. Mm. Um, and I mean, Robert Patterson was good. Uh, Colin Farrell was good. I think everyone was. Zoe Graphics was good. Everyone was good. Like the acting was fine. Um, direction was was fine, apart from the fact that it was just a, a knockoff of of Seven. Yeah. So everything was fine. I thought it was just fine. I thought yeah. it was fine. I'm not going to say it's a bad film. It's, it's fine. Mm. 
it's not this masterpiece that everyone said it was. It's, it's, yes. it's so long. Yeah. It's so long. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm right. I'm with you. I don't mind a long film, but like The Godfather was one of my favorite films, and it's so long as well. But The Godfather, you feel like you're going on a real journey. Like mm. the time just moves swiftly, and you know, before you know it, the film's over. This film, about two hours in, I was like, is this not, is this still going? <laughs> It's <laughs> Batman's not good, is he? He's taking his time. <laughs> oh my God, so many people died. Oh, yeah, that that that's that's definitely yeah, definitely the thing. I'm curious because I know that um, Oppenheimer mm. and uh, oh God, I forget the name. The Flower Moon, the new Scorsese. Oh scene. yeah, Moon. Yeah. Oh God, I'm, the curse of the flower moon is that it? Oh remember. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I know they're both long. Yes, <laughs> yes, they are. So I'm, I'm gonna be. I'm, but you know, what I mean, I think we've all seen long Nolan films and mm-hmm. been engaged, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. same with because I enjoyed the, the Irishman. I thought I was very drawn into that. Yeah, so exactly. I'm not like the fact that they're long. I'm like. It should be fine, but like you know, what I mean? you can you never quite know. You never, quite yeah. I, I trust them though. You're right. I trust them. I trust Nolan. He's mm. delivered before, apart from Tenant, which I didn't like, but he's delivered oh, before. I enjoy Tenant. You, did you? Yeah. We can talk about. We'll come back to that. Okay. About, uh, yeah, I need to. Um, and then the yeah Irishman, I think, gets a lot of flack, but I really enjoyed it. Mm. Really enjoyed it. Gets a lot yeah. of flack. But apart from the fact that I de- didn't really like the de aging, I didn't think they need to de age. I think they could just use different actors. But if you, yeah. if you put that to one side, it's a very, very, very good film. And Scorsese, you trust Scorsese, you, you trust Nolan. Don't really trust some of these three hour filmmakers. Like, I don't trust Zack Snyder for four no. hours of my no. time. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not four hours of my life. <laughs> I know. I know. So you, like- you like. Tenant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was very um perplexing. Mm. And yeah, it, yes, it was. Yeah. Because it was it was seeing because I think you can watch certain things and you have an under you don't know all the facts, but you have an understanding that something is awry, right? Mm. It's not everything that you're seeing. Mm. And then you we saw those scenes played kind of backwards, yeah. but they don't make any sense until we mm-hmm. see them later on. And you're like, oh shit, that was, oh. Yeah. And I like that. That was intriguing to me. Because it mm-hmm. kind of, I remember when, um, oh my God, my memory is so bad. <laughs> but no, look. no, it's, um, Oh, uh, dude did Sherlock. He, oh, Guy Ritchie. Moffat. No, Stephen Moffat. Stephen oh, Moffat. Yeah, yeah, Stephen, Stephen Moffat. Moffat. When he came on board as the showrunner of Doctor Who, because mm. the idea of Doctor Who is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. There's certain things I'm just like, it's just dumb, like <laughs> electronic screwdriver and just shit like that. I'm just like, that's stupid. But uh, there's bits of Doctor Who I don't mind, but I just hated. Well, I didn't really like it as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I hated Russell T. Davis's version of it because it was just mm-hmm. fart jokes and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I'm just like, Ugh. but then when Stephen Moffat came on board, that's when I was just like, yo. And he directed a couple of episodes in the Davis run. Mm-hmm. And it was at the end of um, David Tennant's tenure as a doctor. Yeah. And there was this episode and you see him doing a load of things. Mm-hmm. And then it'd be like, suddenly you'd stop and be like, yeah, of course. And you'll be like, is Homie losing his mind? Like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And so all of this stuff worked. And you watch it. It was a good episode, right? And then under in Moffat's run, as when Matt Smith was a doctor, you saw the reverse of that episode. And you're just like, oh, shit. That was, oh, man. And it was just like, yo, when you thought about the two 
as a one is just a masterpiece. It's just like, so yo. David Tennant did those scenes. And then when they brought in a new doctor, they replayed those scenes, but then with the new doctor, basically. Well, no, you. So when the, the bit the where it looked like Tennant was talking to talking someone, himself, it was actually yeah, the other doctor. He's talking, talking to. to Matt Smith. Oh my God, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's intricate planning. Yes. Intricate planning. That is brilliant. Yeah. Because I'm I, just, I'm... yeah, that, because that's why I like having these kind of conversations. Because you can, there's, you know, and when we talked about Blonde Purple, it was just mm. like, yo, what was your thinking behind this? Mm. How did you, because sometimes I watch things and I'll be like, that was so fucking smart. Mm. I wonder at what point did they think to take it in that direction or what, what was the, insp had they watched something to inspire to do that thing? Yeah. And, Oh man, yeah, but that, that I mean, uh, that thing you're talking about there that's incredible because that's almost foreseeing there's going to be a new doc. Well, there's obviously going to be a new doctor because I think it was announced before that, but then mm. knowing and saying to David, just knowing that in the next series you're going to come back to that and explain it is brilliant. That is, brilliant. yeah, um, with Tenant, my thing is, I agree with you, and it's Nolan, so it's going to be clever, it's going to be concise, the filmmaking is always going to be brilliant. The special effects are going to be incredible. It's always going to be like watching it at cinema. You're like, this is incredible. Like a plane mm, smashing mm. to an airport. It visually like mind blowing, mind blowing stuff. Um, and I think what happened was I, I really wanted to like it, and I watched it three times, and then I was like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. But having said that, the intricacy of it, I cannot question. Like, mm. I cannot question. Yeah, like the bit when the car's flipping over and it drives backwards and stuff like that. It's just mm. incredible. Incredible, but I think I was looking for something that he wasn't given to us, and therefore I think it's more my problem than his problem, if that makes sense. You know, when you expect something from a film, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, oh, it's a terrible film, but actually, no, it's just terrible to me because I expected something different. And in the film, he does one of the characters does say, you know, just enjoy it, don't think about it too much. I think the doctor, yeah. the former doctor, says, <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah. I couldn't get past that. I was like, no, but I want to, I want to think about it. But I shouldn't have thanked about it. Maybe I would have enjoyed it more. Um, mm. I think I Inception Part Two, because Inception is one of my favorite films ever. But it it wasn't Inception Part Two, and I was like, oh well, it's not good then. But I think you're right. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad film. Well, I I think because yes, I think after watching Inception, you kind of think that his storytelling is going to be a certain thing. Mm. And also, I think with Inception, you get more information. Because I will yes. say, Tenant, there is a lot that you have to kind of throw yourself into, mm. right? You have to take mad leaps of faith into, yeah. okay, is the story saying this? Are we going here? Like, mm -hmm. where, what's happening? Mm. Right? And I think that's the big thing with Tenant, rather... Inception, you understood, oh, they're going into a dream and then yes. going into another dream. So they, yes. it makes, it's a bit easier to put together mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. Tenant. I mean, to mm -hmm. be honest, I wasn't even calling it Tenant at first. I was saying something else. And then oh, I heard someone else say Tenant. I was like, oh, that's how you call it. <laughs> Okay. What's your call, man? I forget, but I was I I've done that a few times. Like there was a there, oh my days, Miranda. I think it's Miranda July. Mm -hmm. Miranda July, mm -hmm. and there's a film called um, Kajillionaire. So okay, yeah, I it played. I think the 2020 London Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember watching that, and I was like, I love this. I thought the film was great. I think I was calling it. Um, Killer Manjaro or something <laughs> like that. And then I heard again, and I was doing my review, and I was like, "Yeah, Killer Manjaro, I really like it. It's really good." Blah, blah, blah. And then weeks later, I heard someone say Kajillionette. I was like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, it looks like me in that, it, but it's okay. Oh, that makes sense." I was just like, "God damn it!" <laughs> <gasps> oh no! <laughs> it's too late. It's too yeah. late man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe I'll get some this AI 
stuff to go in and redo the voice. So it would just have me going instead of Kilimanjaro, I'd be like, could you? Could you know? <laughs> Oh no! At least you gave it a good review, though, because if you gave it a bad review, I got the name wrong. <laughs> Double whammy! Double whammy! It's terrible! Yeah. Oh my god! I think I think this new one, Oppenheimer, is going to be good, but I think mm. I, I also think it's going to be very. I think it's going to be his most straightforward film. I don't think there's going to be any twists and turns at all. No, no. I think that. From what I've, I've read something the other day, there's, I thought it was all black and white, but I think some of it's color. And yeah. I've heard that the black and white comes with a different kind of thought perception type of Ooh. thing. So Ooh. I think it might go black and white with the, I don't know, but I'm just a sh kind of trying to think how. And I think because there was a point where he's like, mm, I'm not quite sure we should drop the bomb, but they've invented the bomb. And it's like, this might be the only way to stop all of this craziness from happening. But it's like, should we drop a bomb? So it might go black and white kind of with those kind of ideologies. I see. Thing, I, which I'm looking for, intriguing. It will be, yeah. I, I think that's, so I like I said, I've not been back to cinema since Doctor Strange, but <laughs> Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, I'm I'm there. I, I'm there. I'm I'm there for that one. That's going to be my return. And I think June two, Dune two is coming out. Oh so, my god! So yes, June yes. was so good in the cinema. It was incredible. Oh my god! I didn't want to leave. I'm talking about long films, I I didn't want to leave the cinema. I was like so immersed in mm. there in this. And the world building, I was like, I want to stay. Like, I want to keep me here. I want to oh, be part of this world. This man, yeah. I, I, I just remember that bit when they get to a tra a, a, a Arrakis and the bagpipes. And I was just oh, like, oh yo. Yeah. And if someone had told me they were going to use bag, I'd be like, shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> bag bagpipes are just dumb. They should not be in this film. <laughs> what are we doing? But God damn, it works so well. It works so well. I can remember it vividly. The oh. sand. They, they arrive in the sand. You can hear those bagpipes. Yeah. And, wow. That and, is Yeah. Fun. And he utilized that just long lens shot. Yes. So yes. It, you just see the space and the aridness. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. just the, you know, and you kind of got that foreboding and that just bleakness of this yes. desert planet. Yes. And it was, oh, it was masterfully done. It, it, was, it was masterfully done. And because a bit like Nolan, he only used special effects when he needs to, to, to mm. supplement something. It feels so real. Yes. You feel like you're part of it. Whereas with, again, don't want to keep knocking on these Marvel films, but because you can tell they're shooting on green screen, everything's shot on green screen. I'm so disconnected from what's happening. Mm. Whereas mm. With Dune, I was like, I felt like I was there. And stuff like bagpipes and sand and just little things like that just made you feel like you're part of this world. Yeah. Incredible. I can't wait. I can't wait for part two. Oh, my gosh. There's, I love June. I've read June so many times. It's nearly as, probably nearly as many as Lord of the Rings. No and way. Yeah, I, I love June. There's also, there's, I think the thing about both of those books I find very mm. interesting is that, you know, Tolkien... He's, I, I believe his main interest was language. Mm -hmm. So that's why he kind of invented the Elvish language, the Dwarfish language, and just these different languages, and then crafted this story around it all. Yeah. And um, Herbert was interested in politics and uh, geography, like geology even. So mm -hmm. it was about the planet and how it can mm -hmm. change, because when scientists look at Mars, they say there was water on it. Right. When you look at, you know, I think it's the Sahara Desert and mm -hmm. Egypt used to be rainforests. Yes. Which is yes. just like, yo, what? Mm -hmm. And I think it's other areas that you I think they've looked at and which are now forested. They're like, oh, that used to be something else. And so it's just how, you know, 
nature can change something and how humans can interfere with that process and derail that process. Mm. And I think those were like those things and the way the authors utilize them in those stories is just so fascinating. And it takes yeah. it and elevates it from just a bog standard story, mm. you know? So true, so true. I think, like, I think, what well, I know you're right about the languages thing with um, <clears throat> Tolkien, and I think he also he was an environmentalist as well, wasn't he? Because he mm. uh, themes of saving the planet and trees talking and stuff like this in in, in, in yeah, in, and in the books. Um, I haven't read. I've, I think I've read about half of Lords of the Rings, the first book. Or is it just one book? Isn't it? It's just one book, and then um, it's a big book. One yes, yeah, it, I think his idea was one book and the publisher's like, <laughs> are you crazy? Put up. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so it like, it into the free. Okay. And I think that's I think that's the another interesting thing about Lord of the Rings is the way it ends and everything like that is very different to modern day trilogies. Mm -hmm. Right, the way they will end those stories and yeah. everything like that, and but, but Tolkien, it just seems so effortless and mm. just perfect the way everything kind of worked and that. But yeah, that was one. But yeah, June, one book, big book, and then he had spin-offs, right? Yeah, I think there was, uh, I think five. Yeah, and then his son, I think, took over and wrote some more. Oh, You're correct. <laughs> your face. I just crushed, just crushed your spirit. Oh, that's horrible. It's <laughs> fucking horrible. I saw the life just come out of you. Oh. <laughs> like, it was so disappointing. Like, the way the last book ends, I think the last book was Heretics. I get mixed mm -hmm. up. It's either Chapter House or Heretics. I think mm -hmm. it's Heretics. The way that ends, it's like you've got this old couple mm -hmm. looking at you know everything that's going on yeah. and you're like oh shit what's it? are these gods like what's happening what was <laughs> and it was so you felt you knew there was meant to be more but you, you just the fact that it ended on that you're like okay that's fine because that's so intriguing mm -hmm. yeah but then when you get his son supposedly found manuscripts and bibles of dune and stuff so he took that information and wrote these last two the last two books in that the original series mm -hmm. and it was just fucking poor. terrible it was <laughs> terrible poor. it was just like loads of people were coming back from the dead and it was just oh, no. like oh, no. i mean they was the whole axolotl you know womb thing is interesting mm. and all of that but it's just like bringing everyone back and just it, it just oh it was bad never it do was, that it, yeah it's just never bad. do that never bring people back that's not good <laughs> that's not good i'm i'm just waiting for the day when they bring iron man back i'm mm. waiting for the day they bring captain america and iron man back it's gonna happen oh well no captain america's coming back but because um Sam takes over. Oh yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. The mantle's fine, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah Chris yeah. Evans back and going. Oh, save us! No, 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 no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the, back, yeah, like, in, in the comics, yeah, in in the comics, they do bring Steve Rogers back. Yeah, the comics. They, they bring they bring everyone back. Don't yeah, they? <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> <That's been laughs> like Superman's died about a hundred times <laughs> since he's been born. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's fine. You know, if you're doing a comic series that lasts fifty years, you might need to bring some people back. But yeah, like in a film, it's different. Like you can't do that. You can't just bring someone back. No, it, it's yeah. So I don't know. For me, it's a bit of a cop out. So I can I can understand why you were, were, were upset with Doom when they start bringing people back from the yeah. Dead. That's not property for me that that brings people back. No, and I think also it's just the quality of storytelling like his son is just not the right his dad was and and i think that's the problem right i wouldn't if my dad was a famous writer i don't think and i was like i want to be a writer i'm like mm, okay my dad wrote sci-fi i'm gonna write rom-coms because i yeah, want to yeah. go so yeah. 
so yeah. far away so yeah. there's no comparison mm. so people aren't going i mean it's good kevin's book yeah. is good but his dad stuff was so <laughs> you know what i mean i yeah, i want to do my own fucking thing you know what I mean? yes 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 yeah it's like being i think um so john lennon has a son and he's, he's made music and it's like mm. you may have made music but no one's heard it because no one cares because yeah. You're John Lennon, so you just it's just not. I can't think of a famous music artist who's better than their dad. I can't think of one. I think there's, I think Prince's dad used to be a musician, but like not mm. huge. I can't think of anyone who's been super famous and super successful who's had a sibling, uh, had a son or daughter that's gone on to be even more successful. I, yeah, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't think of anyone that's yes. been like more. Just stay away. Just stay mm. away. Just absolutely stay away. Yes. You're so right. Yeah, I can't wait to see Jim. It's going to be amazing. And I love the trajectory of Denny's Fail News as well. Oh, my where God. Where comes from yeah. to where he is now is just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. When I saw Arrival, because I knew he'd been announced as the director of June, and then mm. Arrival came out, mm. and I was just like, oh, I think he can do it. And then I saw Arrival, and I was like, okay, yeah. He's gonna, gonna be good. He's gonna, gonna be good. That's still the fear. I, I, yeah. Arrival was so shocking. That's one of those films again where they reversed engineered it so that. Oh. You, I when I, when I saw the ending, I was in the cinema and I just my hands hit my face. I was like, no. I know. Because they yeah. tell you something at the beginning. Yeah. You think, okay, that's true. That that must be what it is. Yeah. And then at the end, they're like, nope, that's not what it is. Yeah. Like, God Whoa. damn it! I think my eyes got a little damp at that. <laughs> My eyes got a little damp. I think it was the air con in the cinema. It was a bit like, oh. <laughs> popcorn in your eye, yeah? Yeah, I like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, wow. You guys, you guys have bamboozled me. You oh, me. Oh, yeah. Bamboozled. That was, that was rough. Incredible. That was rough. Good. And I love the fact that she's not, like, she's not going around kicking ass. She's not going around. She's not even, like, she just... It's just a normal human, like she's mm. not incredible. She's not incredible at all. She's just a normal yeah, human. Just a scientist. And it's scientists. It's a bit you were talking about Lord of the Rings, and you're saying how the ending is so different from normal structure. I feel that's because Frodo is he's not a hero. I mean, he is sorry, he is a hero, but he's not he's not Aragon. He's not like no. he's, he's got a sword, he's not wielding a sword and saying I'm the best and beating people up. Like he's got so many conflicts going on with inside him, mm. and to still then win. Or to achieve your goal, like you, you're like, wow, I've gone through a journey with this character. Um, yeah, I feel like now, especially, and I get why it's happening. Like, we, we, I think there's this whole generational shift of of uh, central characters and stories. It's more fo focused on women and people of color, and I understand why they are making content that is. I feel like the the. The protagonist now is almost bulletproof. Like if you look at Ray in st new Star Wars films, she's, I don't connect with her. It's not because she's a woman; it's because she doesn't go through any struggles. She's, she's no. just she's amazing. She's mm -hmm. the best Jedi that's ever lived, and like even yeah. before she, was, she wasn't even trained, she's yeah. the best Jedi that's ever lived. And I have there's no connection there. I'm like I don't I don't want to see these new sequels because she's just too powerful. Mm -hmm. so there's no Luke, yeah. Luke didn't win at the end. His his dad won. Like Luke yeah. actually got killed, and I I don't know. I mean, I, I think the shift that's happening is not conducive to good filmmaking. In my no, I I you know, and it's hard to really I think say certain things because it's just like well, this might not be aimed at me. So mm -hmm. maybe, you know, maybe a woman, a girl will look at it differently. Mm -hmm. But I look at these, a lot of these films and they're like, okay, we're going to put a woman, she's going to be powerful and be great. Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it's just like to, to make the woman strong, right? They, they're like, okay, so she's been raped, she's been attacked, she's been mm -hmm. this, and then she'll get over it, and mm -hmm. then she'll, you know, kill some people and do this mm -hmm. thing, and she's going to beat up all these guys, and you're just like, well, yeah. that makes no sense. 
Yes. Like none of this story art makes sense because usually mm. if someone's been through that much trauma, mm. they're emotionally fucked. Mm, right mm. you're gonna be emotionally fucked so you're gonna have to get over that mm -hmm. and then do this next bit but yeah. you're always gonna have ptsd on mm. these things and so they never really i think it never really tells the story in a way that's plausible yeah that's the word plausible plausibility mm. there's that there's this plot armor around these characters that i mean if, if you look at i think one of the great female um protagonists is is um the bride from kill bill mm. and she had a bullet wedged in her head and she had to get back from that to get to her next steps and even then she gets put in a in a coffin and buried underground and like you go through a journey with this character and you go through these ups and downs and peaks and troughs and you're like i want her to win now mm. I really want her to win. when you're getting everything laid on a plate for you and you're so powerful from the beginning and it's, I don't feel anything. Even I'm not. It's not not just a woman. It's like that could be any gender. Oh okay. yeah. And if that character just going through, like I I would well, John Wick. I do like John Wick because he has been through a lot. But and I, I saw the most recent one this Saturday at yeah. home. Like I'm like two hours in. I was like, this is amazing. This is the best John Wick ever. And then two and a half hours in, I was like, this is boring because he's just he's just he falls he falls down. The sacred core steers twice, I think, <laughs> get back up. But I'm like, I'm not on board anymore. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was. I mean that was. I think when I talked about John Wick, the last John Wick, I did bring those things up because I've been run over and I've fallen down the stairs. <laughs> and you've been I've run been over. Not. Yeah, I've been run over three times. No. But, yeah. <laughs> More John Wick. <laughs> you as well. You are John Wick. <laughs> but yeah, there was no jumping up and beating people <laughs> up after it. I think I the the last time I jumped up, <laughs> the pain hit, and then I was just like, oh, <laughs> it was so sad. and then I just remember falling down the, and it was one of those lots of it was a stair, a little platform more stairs so i <laughs> fell down the first but i was talking to someone and I, and I think i was being a bit like braggadocious you know what i mean mm -hmm. I'm, a little bit, I'm just like yo you know me son and then i was like Ugh! and i fell down the stairs landed on the platform bit and got and was like motherfucker i can't believe i <laughs> and then fell down the next lot of stairs and i was, oh, I was working at a cinema and I mm -hmm. think it was when Toy Story 2 had come out. Mm -hmm. So as I hit the ground, the next thing, people started coming out and all these kids. Oh, and I'm no. like, oh, fuck, <laughs> shit. <laughs> and, then I, and then I just saw these kids. I'm like, fuck, sorry, <laughs> shit. And then I just had to like hobble <laughs> off because I was just like, I can't be around anyone because I can't stop swearing right now. <laughs> that didn't happen in John Wick. That didn't happen in John Wick. <laughs> that did not happen in John Wick. I wish that did happen in John Wick. That'd be great. <laughs> amazing. Because even, like, you're right, when you fall down some stairs, you're not getting back up and fighting again. And then when you get hit by a car, I think you get hit by a car, like, in one sequence about 10 times and then whenever anyone else gets hit by a car they die yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's fine he's absolutely fine and i i just go uh, no nah, i'm not i'm not feeling this anymore this is a bit unrealistic so i'm gonna tap out but i mean yeah i mean if, if you're if your main character is going not going through any trials and tribulations like that would have been a great story your story if you were the protagonist and you fell down the stairs and then you got back up and you went back to work afterwards, that's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> and you did your job afterwards. That's, that's a good story. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, oh shit. Yeah. It was the same day. That you was the thing. Oh, no. Yeah, because I got I was, I was on my way to work. And yeah, I got run over. And what? then because I'm in the union, it's just like having to pay for union and everything. So because I can't miss work. So I went into work and then I was in a bad mood because I'd been run over. But I'm not telling anyone I got run over because I I didn't really 
a lot of people that irritated me. So I'm just like, I don't need you motherfuckers knowing my business. <laughs> and then I was having a bad mood. And then, uh, yeah, then I fell down the stairs. Oh, and then it was just like, yeah, it was just like, yeah, this day is shit. <laughs> no <Not> good. <laughs> no worse, man. It doesn't get much worse than that. That's the worst. Get run over and then fall down the stairs. Like, that's, oh my God. That is, that's a film. Yeah. That is a film. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you're in a great position to attest to the fact that John Wick is not, he's not surviving. Yeah. Any of yeah. that. No. Any of that. No chance. No. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, give me some characters that have had some stuff done to them that I can get on board with. Mm. Have, some flaws, have some flaws to them. Like yeah. Bruce, Bruce Willis in Die Hard has, he's not great. I mean, he, has, he hurts his feet and he, he gets tricked by the bad guy and he's having these conversations with the cop. Like, he's not good at his job. <laughs> no. But we love him because he's not good at his job. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I think I think I think the, I think everyone's trying to experiment with different narrative structures, and I, I really don't think it's gonna gonna pay off. I think there's a reason why, like from the days of Greek um, storytelling of Homer and stuff, like we've always kept things pretty much the same in terms of storytelling. Mm. You know, you've got your protagonist, and the protagonist goes on the journey, and and blah blah blah, and then at the end, maybe they win, maybe they lose. But I think. A lot of films now are trying to sub subvert. That's the word that everyone's using, subvert. Trying to subvert the norm, which is great if you pull it off, but I can't think of many that have. Yeah, yeah. There haven't been a whole heap that really do something crazy that mm -hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, that was satisfying. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool. You said that you saw, uh, you were telling me beforehand that you saw Ray Lane. Which yes, Brian Main. Ah, I love Brian Main. There's, I just, man, I have seen a slew of terrible, <laughs> terrible rom coms. It's just <laughs> what recently, I, or, or yeah, life. okay, yeah, yeah, recently. There's just these bad ones, like there was this one the other week, it's now on Prime. Uh, called Maybe I Do. Okay. And it was bad. Because you <laughs> had this, right? Because this is the thing, right? There was this couple at, a, at the friend's wedding. And it's that whole throw the bouquet, whoever catches it, it's meant to get married next, that whole palaver thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this girl's girlfriend, all the other girls, want her to catch it okay right so they're gonna let this girl catch it and the groom of the people that got married mm. he's talking to this guy and he's like oh yeah that's what's happening and so the guy gets on a table throws himself across the room and snatches the bouquet out the air okay. right does that so in a pack room and then that she's still like, well, you know, there's a there's a bit when they're arguing because they go back to their hotel and they're arguing, mm -hmm. and she's just like, well, luckily, I'm not judging you on this thing because I know who you really are, and I'm just like, yo, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> what are you, like anyone that would embarrass you in public like that, you don't want to be with that. But that's some foul shit because yeah. it's just like. Just because someone catches a fucking bouquet doesn't actually mean you have to marry them. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. what are we doing here? It's stupidness. Who's in, is anyone famous in that? Oh, man. Yeah. Maybe Susan I... Sarandon. Oh, it's that film. It's Susan... Yeah, Richard. She's in... yeah. She's in... yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen the trailer. Emma Roberts. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It was just, oh. Uh, there's another one that's come out recently with Priyanka Chopra, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really like romantic comedy, so I do avoid them when I get the chance. Mm -hmm. So I can't think of the last one that I've seen really. 
Yeah, I can't think of one. Mm. Yeah, I like. I hate the traditional rom com.、Mm -hmm. I don't really like those. There's the odd one that I've enjoyed. Like I liked Bridget Jones. I liked Four Weddings. You know,、yeah. but the ones I really like, I like. Like Garden State, loved Garden State.、Mm -hmm. Natalie Portman.、Yeah. Um, the Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy. Oh my love god, those films. They're、uh, maybe the best. Maybe the best. Maybe. Yeah, they they was, are.、Incredible. She did one. Have you seen the one that she did? She done. She directed one, and it's set in France and it's got. Oh, with Chris Rock. Yeah. So so she's done one. With, so the one with Chris Rock is like the sequel to the original. So there's、um, one. Yeah, so that that's the sequel to the original. So there's one where she's in France and she's with her American boyfriend, and it's so cool. It's a very good film. And then the other Chris Rock one is like the sequel to that, which is also very good as well. Ah,、uh, yeah, I've definitely seen the Chris. I'm not sure if I've seen the first one, but I do like、um, Julie Delphi. I think she's, she's very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I love those. If I'm talking about rom coms, yeah, that they are up there. Um, not in Hill. You got your typical ones. You're not in Hill. Not in Hill, and your Love Actually, and you know your your staple British、yeah. comedies.、Um, but they're far and few between for me. They're really、mm. long. And nowadays, they're almost not even the genre. I think they're trying to bring it back. I think there's like this push to bring back romantic comedies. Yes,、It's、not working. You, yeah, because oh god, I watched、um, oh. So wedding something is it Jennifer Lopez. Oh yeah 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 yeah.、Oh, I forget、um, what is it, but yeah, shotgun wedding. Shotgun wedding. Yes, that's it. That、yeah. so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah.、Oof. It is J Lo. I mean, I'm a huge J Lo fan. That is that is she is the woman. That I would have married a million times over, <laughs> along with everyone else. But <laughs> but、um, her films are awful, and、yeah. the I think the the only good film, maybe there's more, but the one that comes to mind is Out of Sight, which is almost oh、like、yes, which is incredible, yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant in that film. But then that was 1998, so she's had a long time to make a, a good film since then. Yeah. And I think with that film, it's not playing. It's not necessarily the stereotypical character、yeah. that she kind、yes. of then fell into, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's like that. Even with the mother, which came out a couple of weeks、oh, yeah. ago, Netflix,、mm -hmm. right, right, it was better than Shotgun Wedding,、mm -hmm. just. <laughs> but it, but it, it was that silly one with. Okay, we're gonna have this woman, and she's gonna kick ass and do all of this and blah blah blah. <laughs> But it's like I, the, a thing that always baffles me is like you're in a fight, but you're not really getting touched,、mm. right? You're not getting cut up or anything like that, right? You're not sweating. Like in these scenes, and you're running, and never sweating, hair's never out of place, lipstick always <laughs> on point, and I'm just like, what are we doing here, man? Like, if you want me to buy this character, they need to be getting grimy. They need、mm. to run through it,、mm -hmm. right? And when they come out, like you mentioned, Kill Bill, right? So yeah. She's all fucked up. Yes, she you is. Know, broken hand, like cuts and black、mm -hmm. eyes, and but still doing her thing. And you can be like, all right, I buy that shit. Right?、Yep. She's been in fight. She's been、mm -hmm. through the ringer.、Mm -hmm. And and then you're like, okay, I I can I can get with that. But when you see these and the, the, the hairs never out of place, you're just like, come on, man, what are we doing? It's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, I I can. I can imagine that the argument to that would be in the 80s, Stallone and Schwarzenegger were like that. But unfortunately, I can believe that they're untouchable because they are like six foot four and they're built like <laughs> tanks. So I、yeah. believe it. I believe like they can maybe get away with it. It's more believable for me、mm. than or a five foot five woman again or man, and you have no bruises and you've been through.、Yeah. Being up ten, had a fight with ten people. You got no bruises, no cuts, no no struggle. Like that, 
no, that's not happening. Yeah. I mean, that was the one of the big things why I always hated superhero TV shows. Mm. Right? Because everyone loves Arrow and just all of those ones. And I always hated those shows because it was just like, okay, they've meant to have been in a huge fight the episode before. And then the next episode, they're walking around <laughs> like everything's great. And I'm just like, this makes no fucking sense. <laughs> so I remember when Daredevil came out on Netflix. Ah, uh, yes. Oh my yes. God. Yes. Like the choreography for the fight. Right, I remember in season one, there's a scene in the corridor, yes. and he's yes. fight. It, that was incredible, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like he got fucked up in that fight. Yeah. And tired. then episodes later, he's still carrying the limp, yes. the bruises, and yes. I was just like, "This is so fucking good." Yeah, this makes so much sense. That's a great example. That's a gr another great example is the raid as well, where mm. <clears throat> both of them, but especially the first one where. You know, he's taking lick after lick and he's getting yeah. hurt and he's he's in pain and he's he's get he's limping and yeah, but the but the, yeah, Daredevil. And then you are right, it became a narrative thing where you had to get a nurse. Yeah. Had Rosio Rosio Dos uh, Rosio <laughs> no, Rosario Dawson. <laughs> Rosario Dawson. That's it. Rosario Dawson. You had to get her to yeah, I'm, I, I say, I'm glad I wasn't the only one this episode as people yeah. and everything. Uh, <laughs> thank you, my friend. Rosio. <laughs> 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 you had to get her to help him and it's like it became a narrative thing and that yeah you, again you you're on board with the character then you're mm. like hey i want you to i want you to go through these pain and i want you to survive and i want you to to win because you've been through something when it's the opposite and the person's just even like john wick like he does have a few bruises in fairness he's limping around every now and again but it's just too much with john wick yes um, but daredevil yeah. is a great example and Punisher, first season of Punisher, I liked as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, because I, I love John Ber Berthel, 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 whatever his name I is. I think so. Yeah. He's yeah. an interesting, was, I, I, he was on Rogan and he was talking about getting into acting and stuff. And he mm. went to Russia. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I saw that. And it's just like, yo. Mm. Okay, he went mm. to Russia to learn acting, and he knew a lick. He didn't know any Russian when he first yeah. went, and it was yeah. just like he, he, he was going to quit, I think, and then he got that role yeah. in Walking Dead, and then it kind of spiraled from there. But mm. it's so crazy to think that I see him as a great actor, but it's so crazy oh, to think God. that yeah. at that point he didn't think that he was. It's, it's amazing because you think of like the great actors. I think we were again talking before we came on about. There's a lot of bad actors, unfortunately, in a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of nowadays. And when you think of the great actors, you just think it's natural. You just think they just woke up and they were great actors. But you, you forget a lot of actors who are now good. Like even Brad Pitt, when he was younger, I was like, uh, he's okay, but there's something missing. Yes. And now I look at him and you can tell that he's honed his craft and he's worked with a lot of great actors and he's learned from them because now he's brilliant. But when he was younger, I was like, it's a bit ropey. Yeah. George, early George Clooney. Early yes. George yeah, yeah. Clooney. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> it was not good. Like, he was a sitcom actor. He right? Was, he was yeah. a soap actor. It Like, that shit works in something like ER. It doesn't work on the big, like, a big <laughs> film. Right? And, and, but then you see him in stuff like Up in the Air. And you're like. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Killed it. Yeah. That was good. It's, that was good. That's a great example. Yeah, because he was in um that film, The Peacemaker, where he wasn't oh. great, and then he did Batman as well. He wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was terrible. And then he worked with Tarantino on um, Dust Till uh, Dawn, was it? And I was like, okay, just something's happening here. He's, mm. I'm liking this character. I'm liking this performance. And then he did Out of Sight, and I was like, okay, I'm on board. I'm yeah, cool. you're getting better, and then Ocean's yeah. Eleven, and like you said, by the time he got onto um, Up in the Air, he was so nuanced, and he knew what he was doing, and he had the power to not act and act and emote and not emote, and I think mm. that's when that's when you're in your zone. It's when when you're able, you have the powers, but you know when to use them. Yes, um, I, I feel like there's a lot of actors. Like I think Nicolas Cage is a brilliant actor, and he's got the power. Yes, but he uses it too much. Too much, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god, some, yeah, sometimes it's 
way too much. Other mm. times, like the massive talent, mm. I think they got it so right. It, mm. it just worked with that one. But then, mm -hmm. yeah, other films like The Wicker Man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're the like, bees, oh, the bees. Rain it in. Rain it in. <laughs> At that point, I do think it's the director's fault. As a director, you can't be sitting there going, this is a good performance. Let's let's move on. Mm. You're going, that, yeah. Nick. It's interesting you say that because I, I wanted to ask you. Go on. Right? Because, you know, and people, if you don't know, what the fuck are you doing? Because old Double O Flemings here is one of the bright lights of British directing, right? This is a cat that you need to be keeping an eye on because it's only like it's inevitable that, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the Broccoli's were like, yo, we've got this uh, franchise that we want to kind of breathe some life into. Can you do something? You know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? Or Marvel come DC. Like, oh, I, no, I just no, feel no. you've got... Because Blonde Purple, mm. such a good film. It's a great Thank film. And the, and the fact is, we don't have... You know, like in June, these vast sets, and mm. you know what I mean. Mm. It's very yeah. confined, mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel confined, right? We you mm. get these incredible performances from it, like Ellie killed mm. it. Mm. Ellie killed it, right? Yeah. But it's just, you know, I haven't seen her in a whole heap of things since. Now mm -hmm. it might just be because I haven't seen the things, mm -hmm. but. I, I I see like talent. I can't remember the dude's name, which is oh Julian like... Julian um, yes. yeah Julian, and so talented. Mm -hmm. But it is I find it interesting when you have people like this who are so good, but aren't necessarily getting grabbed for roles, and then you have these people that you're seeing over and over again and stuff, and you're just like, I'm just not blown away by these mm -hmm. performances, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, when you have someone on set and you're working with them, right? Now, the kind of a two-pronged question. Like, firstly, mm -hmm. when can you see that this is someone that's going to really do well? Like, when when does that hit you? Are you talking about in general as an actor? Are you talking about for like for, for the role? And like you can see, oh, I can see they're going to go on to big things. Like I feel they're yeah. great for this role, and I feel they're going to go on for big things. Do you know what I can normally tell nowadays? Nowadays, a lot of self tapes. So a lot of actors will do self tapes at home, and then I'll send it over and to the casting director, and the casting director I'll watch them from there. And then I'll, I always get them in for a meeting or audition because I want to see how the energy is when I actually physically meet them. Mm. Um, I want to see how far I can push them or how much I can bring them back. So it's not, I can normally tell in a self tape how good someone is. And it normally comes from their interpretation of the, of the, the piece. So if you give them sides for, from your script and they, Form it, but they give the role, they bring the role to life. And it's hard to say what that X factor is, but normally it just comes down to interpretation of language, interpretation of, of character. If they're breathing, breathing life into my character, then I know I've got someone who's brilliant for the role. And then when I see them in person and they audition and I start tweaking things with them, then I know if they're actually a really good actor or if they just really did a really good self tape. Right. And right. You can always tell a good actor because you, it sounds very cliche, but you won't know they're acting and you will know that you can say to them, you can give them a curveball. You can say, do an audition. You can say, okay, now we're in, the, the film might be a futuristic film set in uh, three, the year 3000, but you may say, okay, now we're in the year 1769 and they will just switch and they'll switch their mentality and their brain will just, just switch completely. It will just, mm. the cogs brain will just go okay cool this is what i'm doing now um so i've only seen a few actors who can go to that kind of level and typically the, the ones i've worked with because i think everyone i've worked with have all have always been wonderful um and there's been other people that i've worked with that i can see they're going to go on and do massive things 
and it's disappointing when they don't because the industry is tough very yeah. tough industry. so it's disappointing when you you see that they haven't but then um when you see that they have you're like wow that's incredible absolutely incredible like um one of the guys who was in blonde purple uh, who i've worked with a couple of times now adam um who plays nate in yes blonde purple. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very good. Cool. He's brilliant. He did Dream Girls in, in the West End and in Newcastle recently. I think he, I think the whole show won an award. I don't think he individually won an award. Um, so, yeah. And then also Julian, who played the lead, lead actor. He, I've been Googling this TV show. He was in the film. Who's the lead woman in um, that Nicolas Cage uh, superhero film? I forgot what it's called. I think it's called, is it Knock? Not knock. Uh, kick ass. Kick oh, ass. oh. Yes. Um, her name is Chloe Grace Moretz. That's that's it. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a TV show called The Peref Peripheral, which is on oh yes, yes, on Prime. It's a William. Yes. It's based on William Gibson's book. That's it. And Julian's in that. Oh, so he's sure. gone on. Yeah. So he's gone on to do some great stuff. Um, so yeah, and Ellie, I don't think I think she's done a couple of BBC stuff since. Um, but it's a really tough industry, honestly. Mm. I think the reason why we you see a lot of actors doing the same thing over and over again is because it's it's not it is nepotism, but also on top of that, is I think once you get your foot in the door, it's so hard to for someone to take you out. It's so hard. Yeah. Um, there's been so many actors of like even like if you look at Ezra Miller, who's going to be in The Flash, I reckon he'll go on and do more stuff. Like he's he's done some heinous things mm. publicly and privately, some criminal things. Mm -hmm. But Hollywood's like, but we need you. Yeah, <laughs> we need yeah. you. I know. So, I've heard some crazy things. Like there was one point where it's just like we're not going to work with him again. Then it was mm. just like, well, we're going to send him to rehab. Then yeah. he leaves rehab doesn't do a full rehab and yeah. then they're just like well if the film does well well i think we're open to bringing him back yes and it's just like what the fuck is yes. going on yes and it, and it's funny how some people get passes and other people they're like we don't ever want to see that person again you know it's like how <laughs> kanye the people are like kanye can die <laughs> when i'm like kanye saying some crazy shit mm. but also Stop putting a microphone in sun, front of oh someone God. who we know is oh having God. a fucking bipolar episode, mm. right? Mm. That there's something weird about doing that. Mm. But then you have like, um, and I always get this wrong. I always get Mark Wahlberg and um, the other blonde one, Matt Damon. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know one of them. I think it's Matt Mark Wahlberg beat mm -hmm. up an Asian dude yeah, when they were kids and beat him up so bad. I think he lost an eye or he went deaf or it mm -hmm. was bad. Mm -hmm. And I know people, if anyone brings it up, people are like, come on, man, that was so long ago. And I'm just like, wait, what? What are we? Like, that was a thing. Like, you can't, it's people want to pick, they seem to want to pick and choose, cherry pick Mm -hmm. The people that can get a pass and the people that don't get a pass. Yes. Like Chris yeah. Brown. I've, I remember there was an award show and I think it was Kelly Rowland was like, stop booing Chris Brown. He's okay. And I'm just like, he beat the fuck out of Rihanna. Wasn't a slap. A slap's okay. bad enough, but he beat her up so bad. Mm, yeah. It was, And I think he was still going to perform at the Golden Globes mm -hmm. the only reason he didn't was Jay-Z was just like if you let him perform I ain't coming I'm mm -hmm. pulling all my artists mm -hmm. and they're like oh uh, uh, okay he won't perform but Ridiculous. they would have let him perform Ridiculous. Right? It, it's, it's, it's this bizarre uneven way we go it's about mad. things it's madness even like Roman Polanski who um, <sighs> you know you know what when I when I first, like, I, I don't think I found out about what he did up until maybe five, six years ago. I always knew something happened because he was exiled. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I was like, okay, this is an amazing director. Let him back in America and let him make some more films. He's an amazing director. Mm. 
And as I got older, and especially like I think three, four months ago, I watched this documentary on YouTube about what actually really happened and his interviews with him. And he he doesn't care. He yeah. he's like, Yeah, I did that. Yeah. I, I did it again in France and I did it again somewhere else. And he's like, What's yeah. wrong with that? Yeah. And I'm like, Hollywood are like applauding this guy. Like Jack Nicholson applauding this guy. Mm-hmm. And he's winning Oscars. I'm like, what's happening? Because you same people were chastising um, Mr. Mr. Weinstein, who should be chastised, but you were chastising him. But then Roman Polanski, you're clapping him. And it's like, yeah. what's happening here? What What is happening? And I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know if, if people get to a point where they're just untouchable. Because even mm. Chris Brown is still performing. He's still selling out concerts. He's still yeah. moving around the world, making millions, like, can't be stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, then he, he threw a phone at a woman in the crowd, her phone, because she was on her phone during the concert. Like, just out of control. And then we have people like R. Kelly, who he was allowed to get away with it for years. He married Aaliyah. When, when she, was she was 15. 15, that's it. You know and, what I mean? Back then, it's like, oh, good for him. Like, yeah. <laughs> look at so, him. So, and it's just like, look, everyone knew Woody Allen was weird. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah. He marries his daughter. <laughs> right? Now, technically, you know, technically, Mia Farah adopted her. He didn't. Yeah. He, but did. he's with Mia Farah. It's his fucking daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He married yeah. her. So mm-hmm. I don't know if the other stuff, you know, with his other kid, Roman, and the other daughter, I don't know if any of that's true because I haven't seen any evidence or anything like that. But mm. on past behavior, I wouldn't put it past him. And yeah. he still worked with Woody Allen up until like 2020, 2021. Um, and everyone knew all of this stuff. Yeah. So true. Like, I'm so conflicted with Willie Allen because I honestly believe, especially when I was like in my teens and then my early 20s, I was like, this guy is a genius. Mm. So as time's gone on and obviously stuff has come out, again, I don't have evidence like you, so I can't make any judgments, but he did marry his daughter. That's yeah. not, not, it's not subjective. He did. Mm. And then on top of that, I can't get past the fact that he doesn't use black actors. Mm-hmm. any of his films and his excuse was I'm not black so I can't write for a black character I'm like what the <laughs> are you talking about yeah. <laughs> so I can't I write white characters because I'm black it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. well I wanted to bring that up to you Marcus I was just like there's too many white people in your films like you can't <laughs> write for white people this is insane <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, you're black, just black. <laughs> <laughs> Could be specifically Jamaican, Jamaican <laughs> actors, British actors. It's, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. So I can't. I can't. I used to be like, oh, but he's a genius. I can't. I can't say that anymore. Like, mm. I, I'm not on board with it, unfortunately. But yeah, a lot of people just get away with whatever they want to get away with, and. And that's why there's so many bad actors because I, I I don't know if they sell tickets. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's um yes, yeah, it's it's, it's interest. I find it interesting. It doesn't mm. necessarily make uh, a whole heap of sense sometimes. I mean, do you like? Is it a similar thing with models, right? Mm. That when you you meet someone that you know that they could go on to big things or they're going to yes. be a powerhouse. They can turn their, turn their hand to different kind of campaigns mm. and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. I think that it is similar. I think it's quite, it's similar and it's different at the same time because I think with acting, when I sit someone down and I'm auditioning them or I'm doing rehearsals with them or I'm on set with them, I can see I, I can see them acting and I can see how good they are. I think when it comes to models, you can look at a model and you can meet the model and they can be incredible. They can tick all the boxes, but then there may be something wrong with them in terms of personality mm. progressing. And there's nothing that you can, you can't actually, you can't actually figure that out until you put them in front of a client or 
you send them a self tape or you deal with like you deal with them for longer than a month or so and you start seeing the quirks in their personality that are not good yeah and they fizzle out and it could be anything it could be a number of things it could be a fact that you know maybe their home life isn't good maybe they didn't broke were brought up in a good home life they could be going through certain things and it does affect it does affect them a lot more than it would an actor like an actor I feel in the moment can turn on. And in fact, I feel like an actor will, will turn on, will use that energy to put in a better performance. Mm. Probably, mm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come out differently. They're going to turn up late to shoots. They're going to be rude. They're going to not do their self-tapes. They're not going to go to castings. So it's a, it's a bit different. The formula is a bit different. But I say on face value, you can. And it's not always it's not always what you think it is as well. It's not always like, someone who's super tall and super uh, beautiful or super handsome or whatever. Sometimes it can be someone who's quite short, but then they've just got a really commercial face, like really approachable face. And they've got a n- nice personality and they know how to work a camera and to, f- to flash a smile. Um, so you can, you can, yeah, to answer your question, you can, you can work that out, but it's a bit more potluck than, okay. than yeah. I, I would. I could easily put like, if I know an actor's good, I can say there's an eighty-five percent chance they're going to be successful. Well, if I know a model's good, I can say there's a thirty percent chance. So it's a bit of a huge gap um, mm. in terms of how good they can be. And you can obviously sit down and I, what I try and do, and you've seen it from the podcast. I do try and get to know the models um, if they let you in. If if they don't let you in, if they're not interested in getting to know you, there's nothing you can do. And you just have to kind of see it as a business thing and you just put them forward for jobs and they get jobs and they get paid and that's it. But then for me, they're so soulless that I, I'd rather not work with that person. So mm. yeah, that's, that's again why I do the podcast is I, I want people to get to know people or, or just a bit of those pe- people so they know these are real human beings and they have real emotions and thoughts and this is the way they're successful. Yeah, I think... You said a really interesting thing. I think it was, I think it was episode 12 mm-hmm. of um, the Sensational Podcast. With <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, I think, what did you say? It was, you, if someone comes with a bad attitude, yeah, you'd rather not work with them, even yes. if you could think you might look at them and think you could be big, but mm-hmm. you would rather you'd rather not work with them. And I thought yeah. that is very in because you know that in all walks of life, right? Whether it's modeling, acting, just you know, retail, the you know, office, mm-hmm. people would rather put money in front of everything else. So if mm-hmm. someone can make them money, regardless of a, maybe a stink attitude, they will work with them to mm-hmm. get that money. Yeah. Right. So I think your mindset is something that we don't get a whole heap of. So what, like what kind of brought you to that point? Like, has it always been a thing or has it been over the years you know, being in this grind, working with people, you've kind of retwigged the priorities mm-hmm. and what's important to you. That is, that's exactly what it is. It's working in, not just working in this industry, just working in life in general, is I've realised life is very short and it can be sweet. And if you're around the wrong people, it's not going to be sweet. So... Mm the people that I want to work with and talk to, because I talk to a lot of these models on a daily basis, like whether it's a short conversation about doing a self tape or doing a job or whether it's a long conversation about what they did over the weekend or, you know, what they love in life or just basic things like that. Um, I want to know them around people who are going to be, um, have a similar mindset, although I'm not saying you should have the same mindset. I'm saying, their mindset is very much a case of they just want to live a good life. And yes. they don't want they they are not here to um to to cause issues in that sense. And that's a very general statement, but you know, you, you can get into places in life where you surround yourself with people who are not 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 um progressing you as a person. And I'd rather not hang around people like that 
which is maybe some people may say that's a really short-sighted mentality and maybe it is but I think for where I am now in life that's what I want around me and in the past I did the opposite and I was like this person's gonna make my money I'm gonna endure them if they're rude if they're uh, late if they're not professional or whatever I'm gonna endure them because I want to make money um, so even even my employees that I have around me I would just be like, okay, cool. They're good at their job. So fine. I'll just endure them. But for me, who you surround yourself with will exponentially either increase or decrease your happiness. Yeah. And the fact that we have about 200 models and I need to talk to a lot of those models on a daily basis means that the information coming into my head, the energy coming into my body is either going to be positive or negative depending mm. on who I'm so if i can surround myself with more positive people great so that yeah i would always choose a model with a good attitude over one that's going to make loads of money business wise it's not very clever but i think life wise it, it, <laughs> it it's working out and i feel more happy and i didn't feel happy in the past i felt like i was struggling to just live like it was it was like people pulling you down all the time yeah 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 but I, I I kind of feel right it's it's a mentality that I think speaks volumes and if I was because you know I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you that I feel your your podcast the mm-hmm. sensational podcast mm-hmm. uh which I believe is available on all Spotify. yeah Major. I, oh yeah, all major. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think you're soon getting a YouTube channel. So yes, we, we sure are. We sure yeah, are. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous about that, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like you know, it enables people to see this different side of like models and the industry and photographers, right. just all of that kind of stuff. And if you're, if a big brand, right, you've got, um, God, I know nothing about fashion. Um, <laughs> Let's say a Dolce? Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. Dolce? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Good one. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if they're looking for someone, right, mm-hmm. they're looking for models for their next campaign. If they've heard the podcast and they can hit it, I feel they're more likely to come work with those people. Because mm. it's just like if you're gonna have to be around someone for this big amount of time, right? You're thinking, right, this campaign, we're gonna take it all over the world, it's probably gonna last at least 12 months, right? Mm. You don't wanna be around people with stink attitudes. Yes. Right? That you have to be on flights with, be in airports, go to like all like so long days it's Mm -hmm. draining Mm -hmm. so if you're with people with negative attitudes who are just out for them that's just it's a torture so if you can find people that are just great people you know good mindsets that's you want to be around them so i think Mm -hmm. it you know i think things like this it, it might start off as being you know smaller but then mm. just the notoriety is a word mm. people talk about it and be like yo i really enjoyed working with them people so mm. man, they did great mm. just build mm. and builds and builds and then absolutely. you know you just you're undeniable now absolutely yeah it's yeah i think you know what you just said there perfectly sums it up and again it comes back to the people you work with if you're working around people who are very um unaligned to where you are and they're going out and they're representing you as a person, then that is who you are. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, those clients don't know who I, they know me, obviously they know my name, but they've not met me. They don't, they don't know, they know my, my thought process. They don't know what I like, what I do. So when they meet the models, they're like, this is who this person is. This is who Marcus is. This is who Baymar. Um, so if they're going into, if they're, they're like you said, if Dolce and Gabbana hiring one of our models and the model is, has a stanky attitude and turns up late and is complaining on set and is just moaning and not doing a very good job. Then they're like, you know what? That Marcus who booked us through, who we booked through Bain, that that person, he this must be how he's raising his models. Mm. And the same thing goes for if you have kids who are, you know, going out and um, running into people's houses. Have you seen that recently? That this 
kid um, on YouTube. Oh, no, he's not on YouTube. He's on TikTok who um, pranks people going into their houses and stuff. And yeah, yeah. And these names, Tizzy or something. But anyway, you that affects badly on the parents. And you go, yes, that kid wasn't raised right. Like, I know for a fact if I started doing that as a kid, I'd be. Oh, fuck. yeah. Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> that's you not, not exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. You wouldn't even think about it. You wouldn't even no. think if you think about it, you get you get you get your punishment. Your Jamaican, your mm. Caribbean punishment. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the same with the models. It's like you you hire people who have the same mindset or similar mindset or similar work ethic because they represent who you are as a person. And I don't just see it as a brand. I see it me as a person. I take it personally. Like I've spoken to this person. I know this person and I trust this person is going to go and do a good job and be nice and be professional. And I'm not going to have any sort of feedback from the client that says this person was terrible. And if you do get that, because it does happen, you know, and we don't, we're not always perfect every single day yeah. of our lives. Sometimes we have, wake up and we're in a bad mood and we have to, unfortunately vent at other people if that does happen i will always talk to the person and see what's happening seeing and see if there was something going on or maybe the client wasn't nice to them because that happens a lot as well um and just work out what's going on from there really okay yeah no that i think that makes a lot of sense and i think yeah from the the, the conversations man you can tell that you know, because you sometimes it's like you and Kez might be on a slightly different page on something, but it's just there's it's always an interesting conversation, and there's never like, oh, you're stupid. That no, 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 no. my way is the best way. It's just like, okay, okay, boom. You think, oh. you know, so it's always it's, it's compelling, man. It's I, I, I think that. I think that's the way everyone should approach life. I think, like, we, we obviously, I mean, for example, you you like Tenant. I don't like it. But it doesn't mean that you're wrong and I'm right. And I'm not going to sit here and argue with you and tell you that it's bad. Because mm. it doesn't matter if I sit here and tell you it's bad. You're still going to like it. Like, there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to change that. So <laughs> I, I like thinking, my way of thinking, I, I always love listening to debates from both sides of the argument. Mm. And kind of finding where I fit into that halfway through, like, Am I halfway in the debate or am I on the, on the fringe of the debate? Um, there's a lot of YouTube channels who are like, I don't know if you've heard of Critical Drinker. And um, uh, there's these geeks and gamers and stuff who, these guys are very extreme. Like they're very much like anti-Disney, um, anti-modern films. They're very right. much like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I like listening to what they say, but then I also like listening to other people like yourself and like um, Chris Stuckman, who are the opposite side of that. I think you kind of fall somewhere in between, to be honest with you. You're not, you, you're kind of, you can go both ways, which is great. But I like listening to both sides because then you can formulate a nice opinion yourself. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the thing with that, right, because you're listening to multiple different things. Mm. A lot of people only listen to the things that mm. feed into yeah. what they cool. enjoy or want to hear yes. like that's the narrative i like so that's what I, i'm never listening to anything that differs from that mm -hmm. and i think that gets very problematic <laughs> <laughs> very very problematic that's that's why people like andrew tate are so successful <laughs> I, uh, I just listening to tate or like your mum's house and stuff like that mm. it's ridiculous right <laughs> what he says is straight ridiculous it is and i think you know i've, I've laughed at it and thought ah, oh, this is it but there's no way i'm going to take it anything yes serious. yes but there's people that will listen to that and go oh i have to live my life exactly like that mm. and it's just like no 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 just enjoy it for the ludicrousness of it Exactly. Don't take it as verbatim. This exactly. ain't a Bible that you should be following. No, no he's not Jesus. No, he doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know any more than you do. He's just making assessments based on his own personal choices in life. Yeah. Um, Jordan Peterson's another one who, you know, when he when he was really successful, people were like, "Oh, he's that, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true." But as time's gone on, people are like, "Actually, no, it's not. 
that's not true. So, yeah, I mean, what people say 10 years from now is going to be different from what they're saying now. And what people said 10 years from now was 10 years ago, mm. different from what people are saying now as well. It's like things evolve, thoughts evolve, time time moves on. Um, so it's never good to have an opinion that's so rigid. I think you should always be fluid in your opinion. Yes. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Because there's things that, you know, that I, I, I do not like the Harry Potter books. I find them dreadful. <laughs> but my, and also because, like, um, so Neil Gaiman, do you know mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman? I do. Right? I do. He, because he wrote a load of stuff for DC back in the day and mm -hmm. Vertigo. And he had a series called Books of Magic. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter is pretty much Books of Magic. Really? Like the character look literally looks exactly the same oh as God. Gamer's character in Books of Magic, along even with the owl. Oh dear. It, it's, and the and the crazy thing is because Warner Brothers owns own DC, right? Uh -huh. They also own Harry Potter. The, Harry Potter, like the mm -hmm. films and the publishing house. Do they? So, yes. So oh. the so the court is this went to court. I didn't know it's that all either. Sealed. It's all sealed. You won't know what happened. Oh my god. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, I know who Neil Gaiman is, but I didn't realize that. Oh wow. That is not good. No. That and because I'm like, yo. You can say this thing inspired me, right? And if it looks similar, you'd be like, yo, I was paying homage to this thing I grew up mm -hmm. reading and I enjoyed, boom, boom. That's fine. But when people try and go, oh, I've never read anything like this before and I just yes. thought of it all off my... I'm just like, yo, come on, man. Yeah. What are we doing? Like, it's fine to say that you got inspiration somewhere, you know, but to try and pretend that this was all you is a bit weird. Yeah, that's terrible. That is terrible. I'm not a Harry Potter fan. Um, I've not read the books, but I, I've seen like three or four of the films, and I don't get it. Honestly, I don't get it. Mm. Um, I don't really see the appeal. I don't see the appeal at all. <laughs> I just don't no. get it. Yeah, to me, I, there's better. Like I loved Greek mythology. So as a kid, I was reading, you know, the Iliad and yes, uh, Odysseus and just all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. That's mm -hmm. what I loved, and you know, things like that. But it's just like my my, I don't like it. But I'm just like, if it can bring people into reading, mm. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know sure. what I mean? Because sure. if, if we're getting all these kids reading books because of Harry Potter, great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, just yeah. like I'm happy. Like I'm, I'm. I will never be the person that's like, this shouldn't be here. We need to get rid of this because I find that's a weird mentality to have. Like mm. you don't just don't consume that thing, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think what you just said there is absolutely true. I think that yeah, for sure, you shouldn't be getting rid of stuff. Um, I think the, the problem I have at times is that sometimes it creeps into the stuff that you like. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I grew up a huge Star Wars fan and um, now I can see that it's kind of going down the drain. So I'm, now I'm like, please get rid of some stuff from Star Wars. So <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. And then I'm struggling with it as well because, you know, you shouldn't get rid of anything. Like unless it's absolutely awful you shouldn't get rid of anything some things are for some people some things are for other people just because i don't like it doesn't mean that the other person shouldn't be able to get access to it um so yeah i agree with what you're saying. in principle i agree with what you're saying until it comes to my doorstep and then I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> hey i you know that last trilogy was definitely hard to stomach so yeah, oh I'm my like... god oh my god uh, oh god <laughs> but the thing is force awakens i was like this is great. This feels like Star Wars again. But it was then... Highlander free. That was my <laughs> thing. It was Highlander free. Was it? it was New was Hope 2.5. It was <laughs> beat for beat. New it, Hope. In retrospect, 
for sure. At the time, I was like, because I just come back, I, the prequels have come out, and I was like, the prequels are awful. I hate the prequels. Oh and then The Force Awakens came out. I was like, okay, this is very similar to the first film ever, but I like it. Yeah. And then yeah, Last yeah, Jedi yeah. came out, and I was like, oh my God. It was a bit like Tenet. It was like, I, I can see something's happening, but I don't think it should be happening in Star Wars. Mm. And then when J.J. Abraham tried to correct it with the, whatever it's the Rise of Skywalker, and that was even worse. And I was yeah. like, my God. And then even The Mandalorian, I was like, okay, this feels good. Like the first season, the second season, this feels good. And then the last season, I was like this. Oh, I haven't watched season three yet. Oh my God, it's so bad. Oh, it's so, yeah. so bad. Mm. So that was my last hope. And um, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. So I agree with what you're saying. I, I totally agree. With, and it's, it's just finding, for me, it's just finding that fine line between me being biased towards the stuff I like and then when it changes, not being able to keep up and then thinking it should disappear. Because, like, for example, yeah. we've spoken about Marvel so much. And my 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 base level thought is, just stop it. Just stop Marvel. But that's unfair to everyone else who's still enjoying it. So it's it's a conflict. It's something I'm working on. I need to work on it more. Um, mm. so, no, yeah, I, I think it, it's, you know, it's because, yeah, I definitely get frustrated at times, you know, because especially when you know there's these great stories out there, mm. but they're not the ones necessarily making oh. it to the big yeah. screen or the small yeah. screen and you're just like oh why are we doing that when we could have done this yeah. and it's just like I think because I might be wrong but what I remember in Star Wars was that the, the lightsaber was a really intricate weapon and not everyone could wield it now right. anyone you're can right. fucking wield it Absolutely you right. know the plumber comes in and goes <laughs> <laughs> Boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? I'm just like, what's happening, man? <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> oh my god, that's so true. Yeah, and the first one was like it was rare to see it. I think probably because they have the budget to show it so much. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it was like, whoa, okay, there's a fight with a lightsaber. I love a lightsaber. Second film, third film, brilliant. Only Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader had one. So it felt really, really rare. Now, like you're, you're right. Everyone's got one, and they yep. can. They're just great with it. Everyone's brilliant with a lightsaber. Mm. Um, like, please stop it. Just stop. Stop yeah. all Star Wars. Just stop all Star Wars now. Let's stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem with Star Wars is Rogue One. Because Ooh. Rogue One was so good, it was that it then made the other stuff look so bad. Yeah, that's a great point. I actually, when I first saw it at the cinema, I fell asleep, oh. and I was like, "This is terrible! I hate this film." And then <laughs> I watched it again, and then I was like, "This is actually kind of good. This is this is really good. This is really really good." Because a lot of people complain that Star Wars is too much about lightsabers, and there should be more showing more of what Star Wars is all about. Yeah, and that film does it. That film definitely does show you more, and it's such a good film. It really is such a good film. Yeah, because it's kind of like a war film. Yes. You know what I mean? But it's set in universe. space. Yes, exactly. I'm, I'm going to assume that you love Star Trek. Star Trek is interesting for me, right? Because I did... So my girlfriend loves The Next Generation. That was her thing. Yeah, okay. okay. I like some of it, but I think I... what bores me about star trek at times has been the archetypes mm. right that we're always got a big strong character and then a brainy character and a little kid and then okay. you know, okay. like and it's just every series has got these same archetypes and it's like oh um <laughs> and i i used to get frustrated with the done in one i'm mm. like this is such this could be such an intricate story it could mm. flow into more episodes yeah. but it's like no we're tying it up now it's done and you're like that time span makes no sense right <laughs> this is like how we, it's like coming to america too how the fuck are you traveling back oh and God. forward to this place which should take like let's say 12 hours in a oh flight but you're doing it all you've been there like 10 times in a week it's just like what <laughs> america too <laughs> 
Oh my god. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was Dolomite is my name, and I was like, yo, Ed is yes, I'm looking back. forward to Ed back. coming back and doing more things. Back. Then I watched Coming to America too. I was like, why did you come back? <laughs> <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> You know what? That's the exact trajectory that my mind went through. I was like, my name of Dolomite. I was like, this is brilliant. And Wesley Snipes in that as well. I was like, oh amazing. My God, so good. And then I was looking forward, yeah, looking forward to coming to America. That's why that's the only reason why I watched Coming to America. Yeah. America. I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, you got James Earl Jones in, roped into this, and he, he's basically dead. <laughs> and you've got him acting. Yeah. Oh no. I don't think I, I don't think I don't think I gave that film enough flack when it first came out. I was like, oh, that's fine. But it wasn't fine. <laughs> it wasn't fine. No, it it was not. It really was not. It, it was so fun. bad. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> just, we just brought it back. I kind of let it, kind of let it just go. We brought it back. Oh, no. I apologize for that. I'm having PTSD. I'll pay for the counseling. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. Do you know what it is as well? It's like even like so I love Anchorman and Anchorman 2 is rubbish. Yeah. I also love Coming to America. It's one of the great comedies. That and Anchorman oh, are one of the great comedies. So, good. so number two, you always want it to be just incredible. And it's never gonna be incredible. It's never no. gonna be incredible. I mean, no. the only I think probably the only times and then there's yes, there will be more people. You know what I mean? You can shout out the ones you love, whatever. But these are the ones that come to my... Actually, I thought of a third one. Go on. So I'm going to say Terminator 2, Judgment yes. Day. It's better than the first one, yeah. Yeah. Aliens. Better than the first one again. Mm. And I think with Aliens, because Alien was straight horror, kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. And Aliens was action film. Action. So yeah. I think that's what kind of helped set those two apart true. from the true. True. And Gremlins 2. I enjoy Ooh. Gremlins 2. Ooh. Yeah. Do you know what? I haven't seen those films since I uh, was a kid. I, I used to love them. So I need to I need to revisit them. Mm. But I've heard I've heard someone say it before. So I need to jump on board with that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen Gremlins 2 in probably 20 years. So I might <laughs> watch it next week and be like, oh no. Oh, <laughs> that's what I said. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, but I think you're right. You're not the first person who said that. I think a few other people have said that as well. Okay. Um, okay. Godfather 2 as well is. Oh, yeah. Think, yeah. 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 That's a good but one. A lot of That's people say one. number one's better, but it's like splitting hairs. Mm. I think those are good shouts. Those are all good shouts. I can't think yeah. of any other films though that I, I yeah, I can't. I was gonna say Matrix 2, but no, no chance. Absolutely. No, no way. Oh. I love that car chase, it's the best car chase I've ever seen. But aside from that, it's not good. Not no. good film. I was I was so disappointed with two and three. Oh, three, oh, God. And then I watched four. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I think, four is the, I think four is the worst sequel that I've ever seen in my life. It's I don't so know what bad. they were thinking. It's, it's almost, I don't know, they say that uh, Lana, is it Lana or the, other, or the other one? They say that she made it bad on purpose which I can only say is true because mm. it's mega bad. Yeah. So bad. My God. Wow. And and it made no sense that Hugo Weaving or and um, was, yeah. Lance didn't come in back. Yes. 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 Like Hugo Weaving especially, like what? what? And like with with uh, Mr. Mr. Fishburn, who's just a legend. Mm. Honestly, like, how can he not be in a Matrix film? Yeah. And no explanation. Yeah. The, the, like, the reasonings in the film made no sense. No sense was whatsoever. Like, huh? And Wasn't then, it? Oh, they, when they say that he, he became a different, he had a different body, different person. He became a different person or something. Like, yeah, it was like a splinter off of 
the original programming or something like that. Make any sense? Whatsoever. Yeah, it was baffling. Nonsense, absolutely nonsense. Um, yeah, I think that's the worst sequel I've ever seen. I think, I think maybe Superman: The Quest for Peace <laughs> might come to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo! It's a yeah. deep cut. <laughs> oh man, that was not good. <laughs> The embarrassing thing about that is that as a kid, I loved that film so much. (laughs) I loved it so much. (laughs) And I look at it now, I'm like, that was so bad. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh man. (laughs) Yeah, those two definitely up there. So the Mm -hmm. worst sequels. For sure. For sure. <laughs> I, will, I will die on my, my grave with Grease 2. I, I prefer Grease 2 to Grease 1. And um, I recommended a friend watch it and he, he put it in. He, he put it on with his girlfriend and he said, mate, you've ruined my relationship with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> she hates this film so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I do love that film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh that's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Like, what is your view on all of these remakes and adaptations that are, that are coming? Oh, or specifically, would you say, um, what, what film would you say? Would you say, well, I mean, we've got all of the Disney adaptations of the cartoons, right? We're doing, you know, these remakes. Like, I mean, me and my girlfriend have agreed that there's only one Robocop, there's only one Total Recall, <laughs> there's only one point break, right? <laughs> because those sequels remakes just mm. bad very mm. bad okay the the disney so i've never been a big disney fan even as a kid so that stuff the the, the, re, the live action remakes are lazy are very very lazy <clears throat> and they're actually failing a lot now like in terms of critical success in terms of like dumbo and pinocchio they're not doing so well mm. so maybe they'll stop i i really want to just make new good stuff yes because even though i'm not a fan i do appreciate how good toy story was and the incredibles and uh wally and stuff like that so they yeah. just go back to doing that that, that yeah did Disney... you watch soul i didn't watch soul but i need oh, to watch soul. soul is so good i need to watch soul is someone exceptional it is yeah. so freaking good jamie fox isn't it yeah. yeah, I think yeah. Questlove. I think Questlove produced it. No way. Or did, the, or did the score? One of the. He was very much involved in it, and that's why he's got the gig. Well, it was that NBC did the documentary Summer of Soul, but mm-hmm. he's now doing the live action Aristocats. Who Questlove? Oh, yeah. Which has got me intrigued like when i heard they were going to do a live action arrested i'm like shut the fuck up man what are we doing <laughs> do you learn nothing from cats like what are we doing <laughs> if they put james corden in another fucking oh, cat suit oh, like come on oh, man. no idris elba <laughs> <laughs> Judy God. Dench, Judy oh, Dench. Oh, just ruining the great actors' <laughs> lives. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. But as I can't, I mean, as Idris Elba should know better. Once, once James Corden signs on, you should be like, I'm, I'm oh sorry. my God. I'm yeah. Out. Um, <laughs> Questlove is a genius, absolute genius. Mm-hmm. I'm disappointed the Roots haven't released an album in about 10 years, but I know. He's so talented, and Black Thought as well. Um, I uh, the remake thing, I don't like. Especially you just said it as well. Total Recall, which oh god, Colin Farrell. Oh, he's so bad. And I love Colin Farrell, but that no, that film's bad. And then 
every I mean for me every remake that I've seen I, I'm trying to think of one that's improved I can't think of one I can't think of one that's improved the original I mean if a film starts off and it's bad but it's got a good concept you can maybe get away with a remake but if a film is almost like a certified classic mm. from the beginning and you'll then go into remake it you are gonna have problems you're never it's just fighting against you're fighting against the against a tsunami like you're yes. not you're not winning like you're not beating like if someone remakes the Shawshank Redemption for example which I'm sure is gonna happen sometime <laughs> it's gonna be terrible I think they're doing the Lord of the Rings uh, remake which well supposedly Warners have said they're not gonna remake the you know Peter Jackson films they're gonna tell more stories in the world <sighs> which I'm like okay <laughs> okay. How's it gonna be though? And I kind of feel you have to work with Peter Jackson. Definitely. Because they, they did this new uh Wings of Power thing, which has been absolutely slated. Oh yeah, seen? no, I haven't heard anyone say anything good about it. Oh, like, oh, I don't know. Uh, like you said something quite quite important earlier on. You said there's so many things that are not being made, there's so many potential things that could be made that are not being made. And stuff like this annoys me because mm. they're just going back to the well and they're doing the same thing over and over again. It's like a safe bet, which from a business standpoint, brilliant. But don't realize that if you make a new franchise, like John Wick, for example, started off as some small indie film. Yeah. And now it's a multi-million dollar um, franchise. You yeah. need to, you need to, you, like, I think more now more than ever, you need to start making some new content because you're running out of stuff and people are not going anymore. People are not going to the box offices are down. A lot of, there's a lot of backlash to a lot of the content you're making. Little Mermaid, I think, might do okay financially, but again, the backlash is there, and it's, you, you're really alienating your fans, and you don't need to. Surely, these are your fans, right? Like, yeah, speak to yeah. your fans, go and against your fans. The Little Mermaid is very interesting. Because I remember when they first talked about doing it, and then they announced that um, Halle Haley, Berry. Haley, Haley, Berry. Haley. <laughs> yeah, not Halle Berry, is it? It's no, Hale. yeah, I think it's Hale Hale. Or Bailey or something, yeah. something yeah. like that, right? Just so, the name. Yeah, <laughs> but people were just like, oh. Can't, you can't have a black aerial. This is ridiculous. What are we doing? Blah blah blah. And I'm just like, it's a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm just like, yo, this ain't no. <laughs> this, you know what I mean? If if we were, de- you know, it's like going. We're making a film about um Harriet Tubman's life. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna get Winona Ryder to play Harriet Tubman. Then you'd be like, yo, what the fuck are we doing, man? What are we doing? This is ridiculous. Oh, but you know, you're making a live action Smurf film and you're gonna go, <laughs> oh, we're gonna we're, <laughs> we're gonna have Oprah Winfrey play Smurfette. I'm like, right. You can't have a black one place, but Smurfette was blue. <laughs> it doesn't make yeah. any fucking difference. Yeah, and she's a Smurf as well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh my god, it's so stupid. It's so stupid. It is so dumb. The Little Mermaid thing, that's ridiculous. Like, I think I, I think when it comes to certain things, like you, you, you just brought up a great example of Harriet Tubman being one of the rider, which would be ridiculous. So I think with certain things, sure, definitely. But then you don't need to be so precious with Little Mermaid. No. Because she's a mermaid. Yeah. She, <laughs> and mermaids mermaid. aren't real. <laughs> no, not real. The thing is, if they made a black Ursula, I think people would be like, "Yeah, that's fine," mm. because it's the lead actress and she's beautiful. And they're like, "No, you can't do that. You, you can't do that." So why do you yeah. make her black instead? She's she's ugly. She can be black, and then mm-hmm. the lead, she needs to be white and have, you know not black hair um so no i'm I'm on board with that but i think certain things you do have to draw the line but not with that and that's stupid yeah yeah and it's interesting now that i think 
because I think it played at Cannes. Mm. And so you're getting a lot of first reaction on certain films. Mm. And so with Little Mermaid, they're like mixed on the film, but she was very good. And I'm just like, are we just saying she's very good because you don't want to say a black actress was bad? Because you then, because even if they were bad, right, saying they're bad, then you have people going, oh, you're just saying it, but she's bad. Mm. Blah, 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 blah. And it's mm. just like that. And when we're in this weird situation where you can't criticize certain things, even and when they're bad, because you're just like, you're racist, or you're, mm. you know, you're against Jews, or you're against mm. Asian people, or you're mm. against small people. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like Marks and Spencer changed the name of Midget Gems because people are like, oh, people are going to be, a, I'm like, it's a sweet. <laughs> like, I don't look at Warren, Warren, De Warwick Davis and think, oh, sugary sweet. No. <laughs> more and if you do you're like come on what are we doing you know I mean? but it oh, is this weird God. situation that we've got ourselves into so yeah. I, when i see all of this early reaction and i haven't seen the film because disney do not invite me to their press screenings really yeah i'm like what? disney fix up man come on Maybe because you're not a show is that why i think so <laughs> I, in my head, I, that's that's the reason. <laughs> Not because they have no clue who the fuck I am. <laughs> no, it's definitely because of your. Sh it's not a show. That's what it is. It's definitely that. <laughs> they know who you are. They know who you are. Don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's hard to talk on it because yeah. I don't know. Maybe she is the greatest thing in the film, and the rest of it isn't bad. But Really? I'm like, <laughs> that seems weird to only have one good thing in a film. You we're, know? Yeah, we're in a we're in a weird time where you can't insult anything, anything. You can't insult anything at all. Like mm. literally, can't insult anything. Whether it be like again, I was insulting Star Wars before because not because they had a female lead. I had insulted her because the female lead didn't have any weaknesses. So I'm not saying that the film's bad because it's a female lead, but I know that people will hear what, what I just said and be like, oh, we hate Star Wars because there's female lead. No, that's not the case. Um, so you're, the, we're in a sensitive time, and we're in a time where a lot of content coming out is more diverse than it's ever been before. And therefore, if you're a critic or if you're just, not, if you're just a normal person and you criticize something, you are seen as whatever ist you are, um, racist, uh, sexist, whatever. Mm. It's not a good moment. It's not a good moment. These are not good times. For I, I thought it's all about freedom of speech, but apparently we're now working towards the complete opposite of freedom of speech. We're now not allowed to say anything. No, I mean, it's, it's freedom of speech as long as you're saying the things I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> oh, God. So, <laughs> you're free to say what I want to hear. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's free, <laughs> freedom to, to hear what I want to hear. That's what it is. Um, it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And as a film critic, it must be absolutely it's terrifying that you can't say anything about anything. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't care, right? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm because I just think if I say something is great when I clearly think it's not, I'm being dishonest. And how mm -hmm. if I'm being dishonest, how's anyone ever gonna trust anything I say? Yes. You know what I mean? So, yes. like, because I've spoken to directors and I've been like, I mean, I didn't love what you did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's but it's like I want to talk about the process, right? Because yeah. oh, you did this whole thing. So even though I didn't, there's gonna be a whole heap of people that do. So talk about mm -hmm. your work, man. You know what I mean? I don't have to love it to still mm -hmm. have a compelling conversation about it. You know, that's so true. That's but so I, true. I remember a few years ago there was a film, um, I think it's Peanut Butter Falcon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone, because it was um, Shia LaBeouf, Shia LaBeouf yeah. yeah, and there was a, a guy in it, I think he had Down Syndrome, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and 
everyone's talking about the film and going, oh, he was so good. He was so, and I was just like, I mean, but he wasn't though. Like, I'm not, because the thing is, I'm not, I, 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 I'm not like he shouldn't have been in the film or anything like that, but you can't say the performance was as nuanced as anyone else because it isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but every, that's what everyone was saying. And I'm just like, what are we doing here? How are we yeah. like making up this stuff? Because I don't think it's helpful. It's not. It's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. And it's one of the reasons why, and this is, I'm in the same position because obviously I make films. So I sometimes I'm reluctant to insult um, other films or other people in the industry. But at the end of the day, I have to give my opinion on certain things. So this, I mean, this is why I feel like the quality of filmmaking and TV has dipped Mm. um, because no one's saying anything against what's happening. So people are getting away with making content. I'm going to call it content because it, it's not great. Yes. <laughs> people are making content that is subpar. And now subpar content is being seen as great content. So now you can just hit that level and it's seen as great. Because mm. I, I, currently watch, I, I currently watch Succession. And, I've, and I love Breaking Bad and I love The Wire and I love... Um, Better Call Saul. And for me, that is elite television, like Sopranos, elite television, like the un- unbeatable television. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. However, other people now will say Bridgerton's elite television. And that is now the bar. So if you yeah. see Bridgerton, you'll now make an incredible TV. Um, I, I do not agree with that at all. No. And I, there needs to, people need to start saying stuff. Otherwise, we're dumbing ourselves down. We are missing out on so much because if you're not giving people a, a level to hit that's great, then we're going to fall b- below the line and the content you're getting is going to be so poor. Mm. People, people won't go cinema anymore. They won't. Netflix sub- subscriptions will go down. Uh, Disney already are having problems with the subscription. So unless you start producing, people are not stupid. And you start producing better content, People are just not going to watch. So uh, I'm I'm glad that you keep it real. I think you should always keep it real. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Bridgerton because <laughs> I I saw a film recently that kind of plays into Bridgerton, kind of the narrative, and I've heard you talk about Bridgerton, and I was one like, what do you think mm-hmm. should be done, right? Because I and you've made the point as well on the sensational podcast, which is mm-hmm. available everywhere. Um, that yes, it's it's good that people can get roles, right? And now people are getting cast in all manner of things, and it opens doors up like that. And you know, you mentioned I think in episode eleven that um, Jean Rene Page, or is it? Rene oh yes, Page? yes, yes, one or two. But from that, he's now, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. I think he's mm-hmm. in Mission Impossible. Um, you know, he's in all of these big things now, mm-hmm. right? Really blown up. And would he have got those roles if he wasn't in Bridgerton? Who knows? Or maybe it would have been a longer road to those roles, mm-hmm. right? Because I do feel that there's these, you know, talent does rise. Sometimes yes. it's slower than, than what you may want, mm-hmm. right? You may think I should be here, but it's taking you longer to get to that place. But if you mm-hmm. continue that hard work, which I thought was just incredibly like just highlighted in your last episode, episode 13, mm-hmm. because I forget the name of the young lady you were talking to. Oh, uh, Siobhan, Shiva, no, was it Sally? No, no. Shivani, Shivani? I think it was her, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, that she was going to quit. Yes, Shivani. And yeah. you were thinking of quitting. Yes. But you just met at this time that sparked you both to continue and I Mm. thought that was incredible and it just highlights the fact that if you're grinding and if you're doing everything that you're doing right these and something will happen that will help 
propel you that next to that next step. And I yeah. thought that was just a really, you know, great just example, like this thing that just happened. And mm. and it was funny because she was just like, oh, I was going to quit. And then you were like, oh, yeah, I was too. And she was like, oh, wait, what? And like she didn't even know, right? And yeah. it's just these things that just happen. So it wasn't like this, all right, you say this and I'll say this. And, whoa, oh, yeah, we'll get started. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just this, no, in this was... conversation, this thing comes out and you're like, oh, my gosh, that's incredible. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think in regards to, um, to Bridgerton specifically, I, I'm not, I would like to say I'm on the fence. I'm not on the fence. I just can't get past the fact that they are trying to tell me that black people were affluent in the UK. I'm not mm -hmm. going to get past that. And there's nothing that anyone's going to say that's going to get me past that. I prefer they use the money they made to use Bridgerton to make content about something modern or something in the 80s or 60s or whatever about and then put black characters into that that i would prefer um however having said that like you're right he's gone on to do a lot he's gone on to do dungeon and dragons which i saw i saw him in recently and i think he's in mission impossible as well so he's, he's gone on to do some amazing stuff so it's, mm. it's really well for him so i can't i can't take that away from him um but I don't like that show. I think it's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I think it yeah. Exist. Um, but then, we, yeah, I mean, we, we all go through these moments where we're at these crossroads and we, we're going to either go left or right. And then great moments like that, like him getting the role in Bridgerton propels him to the top. And um, if we can have more of that, that'd be wonderful. But I don't think we should compromise the integrity of art and history to get there. I mean, in the same episode, me and Kez were talking about Cleopatra, and for me, that's yeah. ridiculous. I mean, oh my gosh, ridiculous. When they're telling, and it's a documentary as well. When they're telling me that she's black and she's not, and then if I again, if I had kids and my kids seeing that and being taught wrong information, again, I just don't understand what we're doing here, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's not in the name of of racial equality because that's not equality, that's stupidity. It's yeah. racial stupidity. Um so yeah, I, I I don't I don't I don't think it's good. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I think it's really bad media and I think it's lazy. It's very lazy. It's easy to go, oh let's get a period drama and put black people in it. Or let's get a period drama, put Indian people in it. It's so easy to do that. Mm. Any, any idiot can do that. It's, it's a lot more complex to think of something great, something narratively strong, and then make that. Like The Wire, for example, is a classic example. Oh, that's good. Why is so mean, good. You've, you had Michael B. Jordan from that. You've had mm -hmm. Idris from that. You've had um, the guy who played Marlo Stansfield. You had the guy who played the mayor, uh, Mayor Carchetti, who's now who was then in Game of Thrones. Like it raised so many people. Yeah. Uh, Lance Reddick, so, that was one of his early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What an actor. Absolutely. Mm. It's a shame that he passed away. I know. Right? So suddenly as well. Um, so yeah, you had these, and you had a British actor in there as well. Another, um, the guy who plays, there's two British actors. There's more than two British actors. I think there's three. I think the guy who plays the main guy was british and mm. the other cop the other black elder cop was british as well and they've yeah. all gone to do great things and that to me that's that's a great use of actors not just black actors actors mm. your trick changing history for the sake of changing history and when you're saying there's black vikings and <laughs> i'm like what is happening <laughs> <laughs> far enough vikings yeah vikings. Yeah. what's happening <laughs> i know it's okay. like there's it is a it's a difficult one because you don't want to take roles away from people no, not at all. Not but at all. i but i kind of feel there's i would have taken two different approaches right so either at the beginning of the show, you have a card, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, this is a fictional show. And mm -hmm. 
we've taken artistic license to tell this story for today's generation. Well, but works. please read and maybe reference some books, these books, because they will tell you what history was like back mm -hmm. then. It wasn't as open to diversity as mm -hmm. we're showing it. So mm -hmm. either do that or I'd create, and I'd probably go with this one, a documentary series for each season. And mm -hmm. I'd be like the behind Bridgerton or the facts of Bridgerton. And then oh, talk about it and go, listen, yes, blah, blah, blah is playing this character. That wouldn't have happened, right? There wasn't really any black princesses or people <laughs> of a, a, but there was no Indian people actually came to the country at this point and mm -hmm. they came to the country as slaves and black people came over from this point and they were slaves and blah, 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 and just break it down to yeah. the time period and what actually would happen so people don't have this full sense of wait I don't know our parents talk about how time was tough because of that show it looks yes cool. you know what yeah. I mean and that's the problem I think with those shows because you know it's like when they were going through all the books going right we're going to take the n-word out of all of these books and I'm just like look I don't like the n-word right but I can make a choice not to read To Kill a mm -hmm. Mockingbird mm -hmm. you know what I mean but don't change it because that shows what it was like in the fucking 30s or whenever whenever absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. i yeah i mean I, I was i did an interview with um around about that time it was the same year 2020 what during uh black lives matter uh protests and stuff i did an interview with al jazeera and they were talking about removing uh gone with the wind from the hbo platform I think mm. And I was like, no, you can't, like, yeah. you can't do that. that that's ridiculous. Uh, it was made then, I understand it's not politically correct, but it was made then, we can go back in time and we can go, we can look back in time and go, that was made then. And this is how it was back then. And this is how people thought back then. It's for me, it's, it's like a, it's a ladder. It's like a it's, a, it's a, it's a step on a ladder of where we've been historically. Mm. If we remove those steps, we're falling down the ladder like you're not getting back down from the ladder so uh, you need to keep those in there this happened you know to kill a mockingbird apparently is one of the greatest books of all time and if it's got the n-word in it then it's got the n-word in it yeah End of but keep it in there you can't get like you're going back and you're trying to remove racism but the racism already happened it's <laughs> you can't remove it now it, it's like, so weird like they removed an episode of 30 rock the was i think it had some characters in blackface but i from what if i remember correctly the episode was going how stupid this is type mm. of thing mm. but they took it out you can't find that episode now on any streaming oh platform no, and i'm no. just like what what are we doing now it's, it's silly it's so silly so silly i mean <laughs> like slavery happened and what I would love in Bridgerton, and the way they could have got around it is they could have had a couple of black characters who were affluent and they could have been served by uh, slaves, not slaves, but served by uh, people of color who weren't affluent, who were basically uh, mi minions to these people. Mm. Show the contrast between the two things and be like, okay, I'm we're discussing something now. Yes. To, to do the opposite of that is, is ridiculous to not show that is is ridiculous and like you said it kind of says oh slavery was fine you people stop moaning stop moaning get on mm. it's it's unacceptable for me yeah i last week i saw um a new 20th uh century film called mm -hmm. chevalier oh yeah, yeah yeah the french yeah yes and I was really looking forward to seeing that film. I was mm -hmm. very into I was like, oh, this is, we're telling this story. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I felt so let down. So let down by the film. Was it, was it bad or was it just politically not attuned? I, I just don't think they did a great job of highlighting what it was like. Right, okay. so they sh they show him as a kid in school, and he's mm -hmm. getting beaten up. He got beat up a few times, called the name a couple of times, but then 
he becomes like one of the best. And this has happened. He became one of the best fencers in the, in France, mm -hmm. right? He was one of the greatest violinists, composers. This is all true. This is all historically correct. Mm -hmm. But what they don't, like they show him, well, there's a few weird things, like they have Marie Antoinette giving him awards and stuff when it was really Louis that gave him the awards. <laughs> so they did this weird thing with that. Then you ha just have him, and he, he comes across as mad entitled, right? Like the way he's talking to Marie Antoinette, you're like, yo, we know if anyone mm -hmm. talked to a royal in that time, they're dead. Not so happening. that's weird. Mm -hmm. You then have him not get, like he, and this happened as well, right? He was up for being the head of the Paris Opera House, Mm -hmm. And then there was people like, nah, yeah, having a black person do that. That happened. Mm -hmm. But it's he loses it at that point. But I'm just like, to be a black person, like, to be a black person now, you get overlooked with shit. There's roles that you should get, but they'll give them to someone else who's less qualified because mm -hmm. they don't look like you, right? Yeah. So if that's now, what the fuck do you think it was like then? And we do have a good idea what it was like then, right? So to say that that's the first thing he was denied seems implausible. Mm -hmm. So the reaction just seems a bit like, I don't believe that. And also, you're walking on a knife point, right? Because you know at any point they could decide to throw you down. So it's like you're you're going to be this thing where you don't want to rock the boat, but yes, you feel that you're talented enough to get that thing. But the active reaction, I don't believe, is going to be like, oh, you're an arsehole. You're a terrible queen. Oh, I'm going to be, ah, everyone should die. It's just like, no, I don't. That seems weird. That seems, it seemed weird to me, right? His dad is a white plantation owner. His okay. mum's a slave. Mm -hmm. So we know how he was born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's never said, right? Mm -hmm. It's never said that his dad raped his mum. Never okay. said. Okay. And that just seems so weird to me, right? And they, there's a bit when she comes into the film later on. And it's like, oh, yes, now she, you know, the, your dad died and in the will he freed her. And she turns up and she looks perfect, perfect. And I'm just like, the life of a slave was fucking hard. Mm. I can't buy that she's looking all perfect and shit. And there's a bit where she's like, oh, I ran away every day to try and find you. And it's just like, You'd be dead then. <laughs> the way, slaves were branded. They were hobbled. They were beaten. Or they were sold. They're not just being like, oh, you cheeky devil. Come on. <laughs> Let's go back home. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This, do, you, do you think that, that there's a whitewashing going on? I, it feels like a whitewashing. It feels like they're trying to remove the fact there was any slavery or any, if that's what it feels like to me. It feels like yeah, media is removing the fact that there used to be any slavery. I, I, I think it's that, or it's trying to play down the heinousness of it all, you know, because it was a black writer and a black director who oh. did this film. Yeah. Okay. And the stuff they worked on, great stuff. Like the, the, the woman who wrote it, mm -hmm. she's written on Atlanta, um, oh, yeah. a whole heap of things that are really good. And it's just like, oh man. And the director, he's worked on some good things. And so I was, I was like a little baffled when I saw they were behind it. So mm -hmm. what, now I remember going to hear Spike Lee talk and John Singleton talk. And mm -hmm. they were like, yo, the amount of times we went to a studio with a different project and they were like, no we want 
another boys in hood. We want another menace to society. We want we don't want a black rom com. We don't want a black war film. We don't want we only want this. So that's so you only got those films for a big chunk of time. Right? I feel things are different now, mm -hmm. but to what extent? Right. So was there pressure for sure from the studio to make it? Or did they think we won't get to make it? So let's self-censor ourselves. So I'm very curious how this came about. Yeah, I think it's I definitely think it's what you just said. I think I don't think it's self-censor, and I think it's the studio going, actually, we don't want that. We want we want we want you to get rid of those parts please we don't want the slavery we don't want the we don't want um the rape of his mother we don't want any of that we just want the nice stuff just give us the mm. nice stuff. Give us any bad stuff because i don't i fail to believe that the writer from atlanta which is a show that really delves into that stuff deeply mm. in a very dark way very stark dark way would allow would want to write something that isn't you know that isn't something edgy. That yes. Isn't touching on subjects that, quite frankly, 20th Century Fox don't want to touch on. Mm. Um, so I think it's definitely that. But yeah, I mean, I think it was the opposite. Like you said, Singleton and Spike Lee, I think it was the opposite. It was like, we want the hood movies. We want these hood movies. Please give us the hood movies. Give us all the hood movies. That's all we want. We don't want your yeah. rom-coms or your fairy tales about black people being rich. We just want your own movies. So it's, it seems like we, we've jumped out of the frying pan into the fire almost. Um, we, we don't, that's why I'm hopeful for Ray Lane because it's a black, by, by all accounts, seems like a black film uh, with a big budget, which yes. I'm hoping stays true to its core story and doesn't, doesn't have any messages really um no that that that's the thing like it's a black story without going we're a black story mm. right and and i think that was because i remember walking out the cinema after the first black panther mm. and just seeing white kids indian kids asian mm. kids going we're yeah. kind of forever mm. and mm. who's like i'm black panther i'm black panther mm. and i was just like yo that just fucking warms me, man. Yeah. I thought that was beautiful. Because it you. wasn't, it didn't come across as, we're a black film. It was just a mm -hmm. film with a crazy black cast, behind the camera black, you know, crew, just doing their thing. Yeah. And, and that's what the joy of that was for me. And with Ray Lane, it's just a similar thing. It's just about these two people who meet and you know, fall in love and we just get this great story. And it's just that, that's the driving force of it. You know? I love that. I love that. That's, that to me is the perfect media. That is the perfect media. I want to see, um, I, I want to see like it's before, basically what it is, it's the before trilogy, isn't it? And I want to, I want to see more stuff like that. I want to see yes. something with, with black cast. I want to see, um, i have trying to think of some original films and I can't, but I want to I just want to see I want to see normal films with normal narratives with people of diversity, whether it be women, non-binary, black, white, whatever. That's all I want to see. I don't want to see any more message films that are so overtly messaged, so preachy. I don't want to see that anymore. Um, and I, I, I just want to see good content that mm. comes from a good place of narrative storytelling and doesn't have some message behind it that is pushed in your face. And if you don't, if you insult, if you insult the film, then you get insulted and there's a big hoo-ha about why you're racist, sexist, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and until we can get back to that, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, well, not back to that. I don't think we've ever had that, but until we can transition from where we are now into that place, we're going to have these um, these debates nonstop, I guess. But I think it will happen. I, I just think to I think what happened was the Me Too movement has propelled everything, and now we're in this weird place where people are making film and TV that has to be seen to be message based, 
And I think people are getting so bored of that. And I think we're going to eventually see the other side of that, which is just tranquility and good films. I'm hoping. Yes. Hope. I mean, <laughs> you don't sound like you're too hopeful. <laughs> I know. I, don't know. I think it just takes people to push it, right? Mm -hmm. And are we going to do that? I mean, you made two films last year, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your thinking going into that process? Like, mm. did you, was there, there's, you know, there's, I remember reading something um, from the BFI at the, I think during lockdown, and it was just yeah. like, um, they're no longer going to fund films unless it meets all of these criteria. Oh, yeah. You yeah. need this many black people in front of the camera, behind mm. the camera, like mm -hmm. women, like mm. I'm just diversity in front and behind. And mm. I'm just like, okay, right <laughs> interesting you know and there's unlike what kind of constraints does that put on a, a director making something with little to no budget <laughs> yeah so the bfi i'm not a fan i'm not a fan of the bfi um i've had a few arguments with them in the past um because what they've done over the years is they've said we're trying to be really diverse and then they have pictures of Steve Mc Steve McQueen on their website and Idris Elba and they're like we're being really diverse, being super diverse. But then when I look at their record of films that they've helped produce, they're not diverse. Mm -hmm. and, and the camera are not diverse as well. And then they keep giving money to the same filmmakers over and over again. These filmmakers are not, are not they're normally white men who are middle-aged or older. So I have not been a fan. I think they've changed some things and uh, this new diversity thing, which ugh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's okay. The Oscars have done the same thing. Like if you want to win an Oscar, you have to hit. Yes. So I think that's ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous personally. Um, I don't, I mean, I think James Brown said, I don't want anyone to give me anything. I, give me, open a door, I'll get it myself. And yeah. that's my mentality as well. It's just open the door and then we'll get it ourselves. We don't want to be spoon fed information or we don't spoon fed or or like have our hand held towards stuff. We want just the door to be open and then we can do the thing we need to do. So the whole hitting the diversity thing is, I mean, this didn't really affect me because I was always making stuff with a diverse crew, diverse cast. Uh, women, men, non-binary, whatever. I was always doing that. So it didn't really affect me. I can imagine it's going to affect a lot of other people. Um, but it's 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 not easy having those constraints put upon you, knowing that you can't just work on your film, your script, and not have to worry about those things. Because if tomorrow I write a script and it hasn't got any black people in it, then... You know, I've not made a diverse film, and but I, but this is the story I want to tell. Yeah, and the BFI is saying no, you can't do that anymore. So it's a tricky, it's a real tricky one. Um, I see the benefits, I, I but at the same time, I also don't see the, I don't see the benefits. Um, so yeah, it's a tr it's a real tricky one because obviously I want there to be diverse content. So from yeah. my my perspective, the way I've made films, it's great. It doesn't affect me. But if I if I then one day want to make a period drama, which I don't, but if I did, then <laughs> I would have to make a Bridgerton period drama, which is <laughs> the exact opposite of what I've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not good. Um, but yeah, just open the door. That I don't see that as opening the door. I think that's I think that literally is opening the door, pushing my back, and then putting me in the dining table and then feeding me. And then burping me and putting me to bed. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't want that. I just yeah. open the door. I'll do it's it's my house. Open the door. I'll go into the house and I'll do what I want in the house. But you don't need to um don't need to burp me. I can do that myself. Thank you. So yeah, I don't I don't I'm not a big fan of BFI. I think they're changing some stuff and I think they have changed since I argued with them. Not because I argued with them, but just since I've changed since I argued with them. So Hopefully they're doing some good stuff now. I don't really get involved with what they're doing. But they do this 20% tax rebate thing when you make a film and you get 20% of your budget back, which is really cool. So 
you know, it's it's swings and roundabouts with them, really. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, I I find it interesting with with these caveats put into place mm. with award shows and you know funding and stuff like that because I don't think it necessarily makes and especially with award shows because we know they're paid for anyway. So <laughs> like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? What what are we doing? It, 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 oh, it's God. like when people go. Oh my God! This person's got a star in a Hollywood Walk of Fame. Oh my! Mm-hmm. This, well done. They paid for that star. <laughs> I used to think that that star was just given to someone, but the actor paid for the fucking star. Well, they paid for it. Yes. Oh. It's not just given. It's oh not like God. LA going. Let's let, you know. Let's who should we you know honor this year. Oh yeah, let these people no. Someone pays for their own fucking star, and you then they that. do this whole thing. Like I'm so honored to get this star, and I'm just like, this makes no sense to me. Oh wow, that's not good. <laughs> I'm gonna do it, It's weird, and I definitely know. Well, in music, I've I know that there's certain music fest- award mm. shows which people mm. paid for those awards. Oh so I imagine it's the same with other stuff. So it's always, it's a weird one. I think awards make no sense. Mm-hmm. I think when Denzel and Haley got awards, that hmm. wasn't for those films. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was all fucked. And yeah, it, it's just, yeah, they, they just make no sense to me. Yeah, they, they're, um, they're very self-congratulatory, aren't they? They're very like... I've not been to any award shows yet. I'm not sure if I ever would, but uh, I have won awards, but I've not been, like I got nominated for, uh, which one was it? Was it Biff, the Biffers? No, not Biffers. It was for a black one, actually. I think it was a buff, but I think that was during COVID. But I got nominated for awards before and I've been invited. I've not been to any yet. Um, I don't inherently dislike them, but it for, to me, it's a bit embarrassing as a filmmaker to jump on stage and like thank everyone for your award and i mean who's to say that this is the best film of the year that no like it's subjective again you know you can't yeah. say anything um but if i'm if i'm being told that my film's good and i'm happy i'm happy i'm mm-hmm. very happy but to get some award that says you're the best um <laughs> am i yeah <laughs> I, I, I think the other thing about the award shows that I don't necessarily, it, I'm, I'm a bit baffled by, right? Because you have a best director, mm-hmm. a best film, a mm-hmm. best actor, actress, cinematographer, blah, blah, blah. But if something's the best film, shouldn't then all those other awards are technically go to that film? Because it can't be the best film if it doesn't have the best director or the best actors. The, yeah, for me, the best, the best film and the best director are the same thing. Mm. You, if you made the best film, then you're the best director. Yeah, that doesn't, yeah, that, that, that's stupid. You, you, yeah, you, you can't be the best director with a film that's not even in the running. Exactly. Film. Exactly. And then you've obviously got the best screenplay because you've got the best film. So yes. what's happening? I don't. Yeah, it's nonsense. And then I'm assuming that you've got the best actor because <laughs> if you haven't got the best actor, then you haven't got the best film and the best actress. And yeah, it, it's it's silly. It is very silly. And then the fact that, like you said, you can pay for it. And there was uh, last year, last year's, this year's Oscars, the British actress, whose name I can't remember. Oh, Andrea Riseborough. Yes, yes. So they, that film didn't do very well. I've seen it. It's not a very good film. She's good in it. But I think what they did was they championed. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Through, she knows a lot of people in the industry and they all championed and they got her a nomination and she's never going to win it. So that to, that just shows the the whole award thing is just nonsense, absolutely yeah. nonsense. So yeah, yeah, you shouldn't be able to lobby. <laughs> no, <laughs> 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 yeah, it's not politics. <laughs> this is meant to be someone, some people coming together to say you're the best, not people and nominating themselves to say I'm the best. Mm. That, that, doesn't yeah so uh, yeah it, it's all very 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 silly it's all very silly it's a silly industry 
Yes, yes. Oh man, I've I've seen the time, and I've realized I have kept you talking for two and a half. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I, you you're gonna have to edit it. <laughs> so much more that I I would like to ask, but I'm gonna let you go because I'm sure you've got a whole heap of things to do. You know what I mean? And um, you know, work on the sensational merch <laughs> and, and go t shirts or I really like that. I mean they're the they're the two things you hear the <laughs> most um, each episode. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, maybe in the year 2027 or something. <laughs> <What's in the match? laughs> oh, okay. But um, yes, you definitely you have to come back when the yes. films are going to drop. Mm -hmm. so we can talk about those. Mm -hmm. But uh, let people know where they can um, keep track of everything you're doing and listen to your and Kez's podcast. Nice. So you can get me on Instagram. It's my name that's on the screen with another S at the end. Um, and then you can also find myself and Kez on Sensational. And we're on Instagram under Sensational Podcast, or you can just listen to us on any streaming platform. Um, well, no, not, not any, but you can just do a Spotify and Amazon Music, Apple Music, and Google Podcast. And then hopefully very soon we'll have a YouTube channel up. Um, we've got the content. I'm just deliberating about when I put it up. It's one of those daunting things. I'm sure you're aware of it, that when you first put yourself visually out there, especially on YouTube, which, I mean, it's a very different platform from Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure, yeah, it, it could be a rocky road. But I think you just ride through that and then you just do your thing. Yeah, yeah, you know. Just quickly, just quickly. Oh, I'm gone. How did you and Kez like decide the podcast? And yeah, mm. how how did that dynamic duo come? It was weird. She so she works at the agency and she I initially met her. Um I initially employed her as a photographer because she was doing that back in 2019. Yeah. And the pandemic hit, and obviously the office was shut for a bit. And we came back to the office and she's originally from Coventry. So she found another job um, that was full time because that was a part time job. And she went off and I thought, OK, well, she was a lovely person. We had a bit of banter. Um, I guess I'll probably speak to her every now and again. And then I think middle of last year, she contacted me. She was like, I'm actually now in a, a new job that's only part time. So can I come back and work part time with you guys again? So I was like, yeah, sure. You were lovely. Let's do this. And then during the course of our conversations of her asking to come back, we were sending each other voice notes, like long voice notes. And we we're like, you know what, we should do a podcast. And then we were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And then we didn't really talk about it up until the end of last year. And I started thinking, I always had the thought in my head that I want to do, I want to talk about the industry, the fashion industry, not so much the fashion industry, but I want to talk to models and people or around the industry. So I don't know what the best method is that, of that would be. Maybe Instagram reels, maybe something. I don't know. I didn't really know. And I thought, Kez, let's just do a podcast. And she was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And then we started recording the first one and it went well. And we were like, we didn't actually release that one because I was a bit controversial. So, so I was saying. <laughs> uh, but then we did a proper one. It went really well. And it was just kind of grown from, grown from there. Um, and people like yourself really help, you know, when you give feedback, uh, it really helps us to, to, to kind of keep going and to tweak things and to make things better. And I'm sure, you know, it's one of those processes where you learn every time you do one mm. and you tweak things and you learn and you get better and better. Cause I mean, how, the way you, the way I can see, like from talking to you, I can see that you've got your, your, your topics in your head. And then you direct the conversation, you massage the conversation slowly in the way you want it to go, which is really cool. Um, and I, well, I think we both need to, me and Kes both need to learn that. We're still a bit rusty around the edge. We kind of just talk and then stuff comes out, which is fine, but it needs to be a bit more structured. And I think the way you, the way you do things is perfect. And I need to learn to do that. But I think give us, give us six months to a year and we'll get better and better. Well, I, I think it's just, 
you know, because it's all about, because it's trying to have just honest conversations, right? Mm. But without it being, so Marcus, you went to the shops yesterday. <laughs> what did you buy? And it, you, know, you don't want this still in weird conversation kind of thing. Uh, and you want to get the best out of someone and make someone feel comfortable so they mm. can just open up and just mm. talk. So it's, like you, there can be things which you think oh, I really want to ask them about this, mm -hmm. or uh, that's a topic I'd like to address with them. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to go, okay, we're talking about this. <laughs> so it's just like it's having a conversation and it's listening to what people are saying because I think sometimes people will talk to someone, but they're waiting for the next time they yes. can talk. Yes. Right? They're like. Okay, no, no, no. I just want to talk about this thing. Yeah, right, yeah, my yeah. time, this silence. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. but, but, and they'll just talk and without actually listening. So you listen to the person because there's usually a way of, you know, siguing into something mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from something said. Or sometimes you don't even get to the things you were thinking about because what they said was just like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. But, mm -hmm. oh, that opens up this and let's talk about this and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just, I think it's just that. So it's just, I think the more conversations you have, the more at ease you are yes. with being able to flow. Because I remember at the beginning, right? And then especially the first few interviews with people, mm. it mm. was just like, okay, I want to make this good for them. But I don't want to sound stupid. I can't forget this thing. I need to do, and there's so much running through your head mm. that you get a little bit in your own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then you know the more you do it the more comfortable you are that mm -hmm. then you're just like look i yeah i know how to have a conversation that yes work both ways so mm -hmm. i feel confident that whatever this is wherever this leads us it will be enjoyable yes yeah when i i think when i first met you and i was doing the the press for blonde purple I spoke to a lot of interviewers who use that technique that you just spoke of, you spoke of, which is ask a question, wait for an answer, ask your next question, wait for an answer. And you can tell, you can tell what's happening. You can kind of tell this is not good. <laughs> this is, yeah, the person's not, either they haven't watched the film or they, or they just, yeah, just, just not very good interviewers. But yeah, I think it just takes time and you get better over time. Yeah. But yeah, sensational is, I'm loving it so far. Thank, you. So Thank you so much for listening. Honestly, it means a lot that you're listening to it. And it means a lot with your feedback as well. And um, yeah, we will have, we'll have to get you on it pretty soon as well. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be fire. But you know what I mean? Like, yo, okay. I mean, that's cool. But you know... Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of models and people that would be clamoring for it. So, you know what I mean? Just, yeah. Um, yeah, you got me flustered, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh God. gosh. Woo. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd be, I obviously, I would be honored. So, but yeah, whenever it's cool, man. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Cool. Yeah. All right, Mister Fleming. Hey, Mister Mister Scott, for the Thank conversation. You, this has been yeah. just great. Another just yeah. I always enjoy our our back and forth. So it's mm. always um, it's always interesting. So yes, we'll, we'll do we'll do another one. We'll do another one. There's so many other topics we need to delve into. Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, people, right. go check out Sensational if you haven't watched it. And again, what the fuck are you doing? Go check out Blonde Purple, just for starters. And Mr. Fleming's here has got quite a few films under his belt. So start off with Blonde Purple and then go back through the back catalogue. You will not be disappointed. And remember, that's the face you're going to be seeing all over the shop. Disney, 20th century, Universal, <laughs> like, this motherfucker's going to be picking up franchises, originals. Yo, Fleming's going to be 
ruling the world. Oh, wow. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh god okay <laughs> uh, hey i don't say things if i don't believe them your films Thank are great you. like you. you can clearly see that the the agency and just i think what you're doing around representation you know what i mean and just getting all your models and pushing them and you can just tell from those conversations, how much you care for the people you work with. I think mm -hmm. that is great, mm -hmm. right? And especially in an industry that is often looked, time, looked upon as being vapid and empty, right? Mm -hmm. That you can really see that there's soul and heart there. And so yeah. I think these are the things that keep you rising, my friend. So I'm just happy to see you succeed. Thank you very much, sir. And have a, have a beautiful... Uh day you too man you too all right until next time peace